<laughs> you do want to do that. Like, it's, it's misleading. Like, the angry people were asking for it. But it's like, oh, yeah. so, like, cool. Okay. <laughs> like, you know,
Members of Council, if you can please take your seats. We do have quorum. Can you please rise for the national anthem? Please remain standing and during this time, remember the following persons who have passed away. Wayson Choi, Fitzroy Gordon, Christopher Gort, Lois James, George Martell, Don Richmond, and Kelly Thompson. Thank you. <coughs> we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. For the benefit of those who are connected to the internet, the City Clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. Councillor Thompson, I believe you have an announcement. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this is an announcement for Sati Sai School and their annual Walk for Values. Sati Sai will be visiting City Hall and attending the uh, City Council this morning. I'm not sure if they're here yet. I didn't see them behind me. I don't see them here, but make the announcement anyways. Um, speaker, it appears that they were coming at 10.30, according to what I have here. So if it's okay with you, may I hold this down perhaps when they arrive because it's, yeah, just it's counterintuitive to make a announcement welcoming them to City Hall when they're not here. Okay. Um, if I could. I, I wasn't aware they're coming at 10. Nor was I. So, I just okay, so we'll Thank you very hold much, the item down. Thank My you. apologies. Thank, Thank you. you. I will now call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councillor Ford, you have um, a motion on the minutes from our last meeting. I do, Madam Speaker, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, that City Council confirmed uh, the minutes of Council under the regular meeting held on April 16th and 17th, 2019, in the form supplied to the members. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce their reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Mayor Tory, you have a motion to introduce the executive committee report. I do, and I'm happy to deal with that now. I thought I was going to say a few words to council before that, Madam Speaker, about uh, one of the items today, but perhaps that's not part of your. That, I, that's, uh, I believe that's coming when we do, after we complete this. Okay. Well, uh, I, then I won't comment at all other than to introduce uh, the motion that the report from meeting five of the executive committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for uh, consideration. 
Okay, thank you. What's that all about? Councillor Cressy, you have a motion uh, to introduce the Board of Health report. I, I do, Speaker, that the report from meeting six of the Board of Health listed on the agenda be considered by Council. Uh, and I will make a few remarks. Uh, as everyone here knows, on the Thursday afternoon before the long weekend, without notice, without warning, and without an ounce of consultation, the province announced a retroactive $1 billion cut to Toronto Public Health over the next 10 years. It was retroactive. As our budget chief knows, that's not how municipalities operate. And in fact, this cut takes us back to the pre-Walkerton and pre-SARS days of funding. In fact, the, uh, the province of Ontario is the only province in Canada that doesn't fund public health at 100% of the costs. The absolute only one. And so what does Toronto Public Health do? As every member of this council knows, Toronto Public Health is active in every neighbourhood, in every community, in every corner of our city. Whether you're one of the 634 schools that provide student breakfast programs to the 211,000 kids, that's Toronto Public Health in your neighbourhood. Whether you're one of the schools get, that gets 50,000 doses of vaccines every single year, that's public health in your neighbourhood. Whether it's the dental screenings for kids aged 4 to 12, 220,000 of them every single year, that's public health. And whether it's food quality and the 32,000 inspections we do every year in every neighbourhood, that's public health. The irony of public health is that when it's successful, it is invisible. You don't see it. How many times have you read a headline in the paper, child doesn't get meningitis? You've never seen that headline because Toronto Public Health works to prevent it. That's been no more evident than in the recent days regarding a measles scare. A scare that is not an outbreak because of the work of public health. And so when you invest in public health, not only do you prevent the diseases of tomorrow and improve people's health tomorrow, but you prevent health care costs from rising. For every dollar you put into vaccines, you save $16 in health care costs. For every dollar you put into tobacco prevention, you save $20 in health care costs. If you have any interest whatsoever in ending hallway health care, investing in public health is the best place to start. And so today we will be considering these cuts and what our response sh should be. And I would urge all of you, as you consider our response, to realize that across this province, from Thunder Bay to Sarnia, and from Peterborough to Halliburton, from Toronto to Ottawa, communities across ge geographical and across political lines are standing united. When you have the mayors of the 28 largest cities in Ontario speaking with one voice, when you have the Ontario Medical Association, the Ontario Nurses Association, and the Ontario mm -hmm. Pediatric Society, it takes a lot to piss off all three of them. But that's happened here. And so it is time for us, collectively, to come together to ensure that public health and the health and well-being of our residents in Toronto and the residents right across this province are taken care of. And I urge you to consider this item seriously. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, you have a motion to introduce the Audit Committee report. I do. Thank you and good morning, Madam Speaker that the report from meeting two of the audit committee listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Members, I will uh, point to you that there are seven reports from the audit committee on today's agenda. Um, we had a great audit meeting. Uh, we talked a lot at the meeting. Uh, the first item is a discussion on Toronto Community Housing Corporation's alignment with strategic priorities of this council. And, the audit talks a lot about the relationship of the corporation with the council. I'll take a moment to remind members that uh, there's a special committee on governance. And when I read this audit, I thought a lot about that committee because it talks about the relation of an agency with council and how it aligns its business plans and its priorities with, with our priorities. And that's a generic statement. Although this audit is specific, um, I'll take a moment to remind members that if you're serving on the boards of agencies, boards and commissions, maybe you'll take a, some time to think about that relationship with council. And if you've got advice, please forward it through the city manager's office so that the special committee can look at it. Uh, there are two audits on fleet services. 
Um, both are different topics. One of them has to do with uh, the lengthy downtime of vehicles while they're being repaired and what that points to productivity and fleet size. And there's another audit about um, the oversight of underutilized vehicles. And that is vehicles that are seldom used or driven for less than 5,000 kilometers in a year. Uh, both are important audits and are very helpful to fleet services as they continue their transformation. But I would urge, urge members to uh, take notice of these uh, and think about them. Um, there's an audit on the review of urban forestry. You may have seen a little bit of that in the news. Uh, it got lots of discussion and questions at audit committee. Uh, it is important uh, because it, uh, it is a, um, an example of the auditor's look of contract management in this city. And there are a number of lessons that can be drawn out of that audit, uh, not only applicable to forestry, but various divisions in the city. There's an audit on the Toronto Transit uh, Commission's Revenue Operations and Fair Evasion. I think many members would be familiar with the subject of this because it went through TTC previously, but again, another uh, audit that got lots of discussion at Audit Committee, and the auditor has done a great job putting together a video, uh, which would be the Coles notes of what they found in the audit, and I would urge members to have a look at that. And there are two other audits which are similar in nature, and those are reports from the Auditor General about outstanding audits. The first one is a, re, uh, a more of a routine audit. We see those on several of the audit agendas, excuse me, a routine report, not an audit, on the audit agendas having to do with the divisions of community and social services. But the other one I'll take a moment to point out to members, it was a special request of the audit committee. And it was the auditor's report on several uh, important outstanding audits. And uh, it is here before council, but I think you'll find that that report will come back to the audit committee as we engage in a process to monitor the outstanding audits. And the auditor's done a fine job of pointing out audits that we as a council should be paying attention to um, because they are outstanding and have not yet been fully implemented. Um, with that, I look forward to the debate and uh, would like to remind councillors that both I as the Chair of Audit uh, and the Auditor General are certainly available to you if you had any questions uh, about any of the reports. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you have a motion to introduce the Economic and Community Development Committee report. I guess I do, Speaker, that the report from meeting four of Economic and Community Development uh, Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And I have no further comments. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley, you have a motion to introduce the General Government and Licensing Committee report. Good morning, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting number four of the General Government and Licensing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the Infrastructure and Environment Committee report. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting four of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee listed on the agenda council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Bylaw, you have a motion to introduce the Planning and Housing Committee report. Yes, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting five of the Planning and Housing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And uh, we had a, a wonderful meeting with a wonderful guest uh, that joined us at uh, this committee, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Uh, Leilani Farr, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, uh, participated and presented our meeting, and uh, we had a great discussion around the right to housing. Uh, uh, after that, we also had a great discussion about how to protect uh, dwelling rooms. And for your information, that work is set, being sent back for public consultation. But as you know, housing is not only about building, it's also about protecting the stock that we have. And we're doing great work in the Planning and Housing Committee to make sure that we're protecting everything from dwelling rooms to grooming houses to the proper stock of housing. And so there is important work being uh, done in there. In there. Uh, we have a series of uh, also um, uh, supports for new affordable housing in this, uh, in this report. But I would like to comment on the fact on actually something that is being brought as new business because our planning staff 
didn't have the opportunity to actually be able to properly report to the Planning and Housing Committee because the provincial government actually dropped legislation and, and changes that are, uh, will have a serious impact on how we plan our city and how we build our city. And with a 30-day notice, we actually will have to have it as a new business and uh, the report will be tabled uh, as soon as staff, staff is able to finish. But I think there's three important components that I hope people are paying close attention. You know, this legislation is about bringing back the OMB and taking the uh, representation and the voice that was given to this council chambers and to the citizens of the various municipalities of, uh, of this province. This bill is also about the growth plan. There's a lot of lands in the growth plan that are now going to be available for conversion just from one day to the other. And finally, the development charges, the impacts that the development charges will have on the many, many capital projects that we have under going. Just this weekend alone, I was able to open a community center in my ward that was done completely with Section 37, with my community at the table, with negotiations. And this is how we build communities, how we grow communities. And this is what we, are, we have at risk, and this is what we're going to be able to get more information. Unfortunately, very rushed, dropped at council in here because we, we, did, we don't have the opportunity to have the proper discussion through the committee that it should have gone and, and uh, have appropriate time for this council, council to uh, ponder and to actually uh, give its proper opinion. So I call your attention not only for the items on the planning and growth agenda, but for item 7.3 on the new business uh, and to have a robust discussion about Bill 108. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, you have a motion to introduce the Tobacco York Community Council report. Thank you. And good morning, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting five of the Tobacco York Community Council list of the agenda of council will be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the North York Community Council report. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting five of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor McKelvey, you have a motion to introduce the Scarborough Community Council report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting five of the Scarborough Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. Good morning, Speaker. I move that the report from meeting five of the Toronto East York Community Council listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, you have a motion to introduce the new business from city officials. Yes, Madam Speaker, the new business from city officials listed on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. All those in favor of the motions? Recorded vote. Councillor Layton, please. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher, thank you. The motion to introduce the report carries unanimously 23 in favor. Uh, Mayor Tory, would you like to take this opportunity to address City Council? I'll do it from here if I may, Madam, Madam Speaker. Speaker. I think the intention was I would do it before those motions were uh, moved, and it's going to happen in any event in advance of uh, putting on the table what I'm going to speak to. And I, out of deference to Council's time, did not take any time introducing the Executive Committee report uh, so that we would not uh, use up excessive time. First of all, good morning, uh, colleagues. And I'm addressing uh, the Council directly because I think that these are unprecedented times for our city and for all cities across the province. Uh, today we will be discussing the provincial budget and the $177.6 million pressure that it creates on this city's finances this year. Uh, we are faced with retroactive cuts by the Government of Ontario to our budget that was already approved earlier this year. The city manager has clearly, professionally and objectively outlined the impacts of the funding cuts to child care, to public health, uh, to Toronto Paramedic Services uh, and TTC upkeep and repairs. 
it is clear that these cuts will hurt families. Real people's lives will be made harder if these cuts proceed. Thousands of families risk losing their child care subsidies. Student breakfast programs we fund to make sure that kids uh, are healthier and are able to focus on school are in peril with cuts to public health funding. Due to a cut for funding for EMS, it will be, make, it'll be made more difficult for us to put more paramedics on our streets this year to help deal with a growing population and an aging population. So all of these cuts threaten not just the well-being of our city, but threaten the prosperity of our city, a prosperity that every government should be committed to maintaining and expanding. And that is because, as we know, and the facts bear this out day in and day out, Toronto is, economic, is the economic engine of Ontario, and these cuts run the risk of stalling that engine. A healthy and strong Toronto is good for Ontario and good for Canada. Major changes to our budget pose a real threat to Toronto's prosperity and defy logic. And that's why we have been standing up for Toronto and speaking out against these cuts. And I have been joined in that by a broad range of councillors who are committed to this advocacy. This is not partisan bickering or politics as is often presented. Uh, these cuts are a carefully crafted and unfairly harsh offensive against services needed by the residents of the City of Toronto. And we are responding to that on behalf of the residents that we were elected to represent in order to protect this city, to build this city up, to protect them and the services that they need, and to always stand up for Toronto. That's our job. I think it is important that Council sends a united message today to our residents as much as to the government that these cuts will hurt our city and will impact on those residents directly. Residents should know that these cuts have been imposed on their city without any meaningful consultation and in a way that guarantees financial chaos, to use the words not of mine, not of the city managers, to use the words of Ottawa's mayor, uh, Jim Watson, in responding to exactly the same cuts as applied to his city. And I believe it is the residents who will help send a message to the province strongly suggesting they should change course. There has been no regard taken of the budget process of our city or of other cities for that matter. A budget process governed by provincially mandated conditions which saw us approve a balanced budget months ago. There has been no recognition that we already spent months, particularly our city staff, finding efficiencies in our budget in order to ensure for the fifth year in a row that we could keep taxes at the rate of inflation while also investing more in key services like transit, like policing and like recreation, just to name a few. I have been very clear in my repeated public comments concerning our willingness to see city representatives sit down with the province and talk about how both of our governments could work together to achieve efficiencies. And I repeat that invitation to do so today. There has been no response to date uh, to those invitations extended publicly and privately. We all support running governments that are as efficient as possible. But imposing downloading cuts by stealth that stretch back to April the 1st is not how you find those efficiencies or actually serve the residents. Finally, I will say that this is not the first time that a provincial government has slashed funding for cities. Back in 2013, the province proceeded to cut $150 million from the city, starting with $50 million in the 2014 budget. Members of council were properly outraged, including then Mayor Rob Ford. The province was dismissive of the city's objections. But one councillor in particular summed it up this way, and I think it was a very solid summation. That councillor told CP24 that, and I quote, we've been prudent managers of the taxpayers' money, but these folks, the province, want to come back and put the burden on the back of the hardworking people of Toronto, the residents of Toronto. It's not fair, close quote. That councillor was the vice chair of the budget committee for four years and is now the premier of the province of Ontario. So I think it is important that we send a clear and united message today to that premier and to the MPPs in his government who represent Toronto and the message would be like this. We continue to be prudent managers of taxpayers' money. And you were absolutely right in 2013. It isn't fair that the province is putting the burden on the backs of the hardworking property taxpayers and people who live in the City of Toronto. So I look forward to today's debate, Madam Speaker, and sending at least three messages. One, our profound opposition to these cuts and the unilateral, retroactive way in which they were imposed well into our financial year. Secondly, 
our willingness to start over with a business-like consultative process through which we try to find efficiencies together. And third, our resolve to take our concerns and our message to the people of Toronto by whatever means are necessary so that the government, but especially Toronto area MPPs, will put people and good public policy ahead of party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. And I remember those uh, comments that were made at Council by the Premier. Councillor Crawford, I understand you have a procedure motion at this time. Uh, yes, I do, Madam Speaker. Um, that in accordance with Section uh, 27. Uh, dash, uh, 710, the Council Procedures City Council will move item SC 6.4, headed Traffic and Parking Amendments, uh, Kingston Road, Brimley Road, Barkdean Hills from Scarborough Community Council, and bring the item uh, to City Council for consideration. This is around concerns around the parking around uh, Bluffers Park, uh, and I want to be able to get some uh, decisions made before the uh, summer starts. So this is, it was on uh, Community Council for May and then coming to Council in June. I'm trying to get this to Council as quick as possible. Thank you. On favor? Carried. Okay, are there any declarations of interest? If you do, please put your name up, request to question staff. Please indicate the committee, the item or motion number and the nature of the interest. And remember that you must also file a written declaration of your interest uh, with the city clerk. No? Okay. I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd rise just to present a petition here on behalf of the residents of Beaches East York, uh, 188 signatures. Uh, and by signing this petition, these residents are calling on Premier Ford to cancel all cuts to Toronto Public Health's budget and protect health care programs uh, and public health programs in Beaches East York and the City of Toronto. Um, we went door to door and talked to numerous residents uh, at some of our public schools, at transit stations, uh, and in the neighborhood, and just outlining specifically that in Beaches East York, Ward 19, there will be nearly 100 public health services uh, that would be impacted uh, as a result of this $65 million hole in our Toronto public health budget for 2019. Those programs include school immunization, food inspections, diabetes prevention, leadership training for at-risk youth, and outbreak responses. So I just wanted to present that with Council today, and thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I rise to submit 8,967 uh, petitions uh, from Torontonians representing every ward in the city. These petitions and these residents are calling on the province to reverse, and I quote, their short-sighted and dangerous cuts to public health, end quote, and they're calling on City Council to stand up for the health of our residents and re seek to reverse these cuts. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. All those in favor of receiving the petitions, a uh, recorded vote. Councillor Bailau, please. <laughs> the motion to receive the petitions carries unanimously 23 in favour. Thank you. Members, I will now review the order paper. The Mayor has designated item MM 7.13 headed Impact of 2019 for Provincial Budget on the City of Toronto, and item EX 5.1 headed Ontario Place Exhibition Place Revitalization as is key matters for this meeting. We will now review the necessary procedure steps on the Mayor's first key item when we get to that, when we get to the item. There, these will be our first and second items of business today. 
Members, there are a number of items related to the Mayor's two key matters that I propose be considered together with the Mayor's consent. Item HL 6.1, headed 2019-2020 Ontario Budget Announcement for Toronto Public Health. Update with the Mayor's first key, key matter, MM 7.13, and items T 5.26, and T, 5.27 regarding exhibition place in Ontario Place with the Mayor's second key matter, item EX 5.1. Mayor Tory, do you consent to the joining of these items to your key matters? I do, Madam Speaker. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Members, I also propose that two other related items on the agenda be considered together. AU 2.2 on Fleet Services Operational Review Phase 1, Lengthy Downtime Requires Immediate Attention. With item AU 2.3 on Fleet Services op Operational Review Phase 1, Stronger Corporate Oversight Needed for Underutilized Vehicles. Notices and motions are scheduled to be dealt with at 2 p.m. tomorrow, only if the Mayor's key matters are completed. I propose that City Council set a time for a closed session, if required, later in this meeting. The City Clerk has noted the items that members wish to hold. I will now go through the items listed on the order paper to take additional holds. I will recognize requests to make matters urgent and time-specific after I go through the items for additional holds. Once the order paper has been approved by Council, any change would need a two-thirds vote. Page three. Councillor Fillion. Um, Executive 5.2 and um, AU 2.4, unless the chair was intending to hold it. No. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd be prepared to release EX 5.3 on a recorded vote. Okay, on page 3, EX 5.3, Councillor Pasternak is releasing recorded vote. The item is adopted unanimously, 23 in favor. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, th thank you, Speaker. I'd like to hold item AU 2.1, moving forward together. Oh, would you like to hold that? Uh, Pardon? Councillor Fletcher is coming up, actually wants to hold that. <clears throat> okay. Councillor Fletcher. No, no, okay. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Councillor Fletcher, yes. Thank you. As my friend Councillor Cressy said, I'd like to hold AU 2.1. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Pete. X 5.7 as well, please. Initiative to reduce the number of unwanted. Oh, no, not that one. I'm sorry. My mistake. Just the one on uh, AU 2.1. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Page four, Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I had some questions on HL 6.3, service agreements awarded and executed by the Medical Officer of Health for 2019. Okay, Councillor Cole. I, I had uh, wished to hold EX 5.7 on the initiative to reduce the number of unwanted firearms back on page three. So you want to hold that one? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, we're at page four. Um, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to hold GL 4.7, Redevelopment of St. Lawrence Market Construction Contract Award and Amendment to Project Capital Budget. 
Thank you. Councillor Ford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold on page 4, AU 2.6. Auditor General's response to the Audit Committee's request on the outstanding audit recommendations, which are of greatest concern. Okay, thank you. Page 5. Councillor Holliday. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold PH 5.6, Vital Service Disruptions in Apartment Buildings. Councillor Wang Tan. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold PH 5.1 as well as PH 5.3. Shall I read the title as well? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, page 5.1, the right to adequate housing. Page 5.3, creating affordable rental homes at the West Onlands and 27 Grosvenor and 26 Grenville. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. On page uh, 5, I, I'm actually prepared to release IE 4.3, Metrolink's Vince West uh, LRT, construction staging areas, lane closures, and extension of temporary uh, delegation for long-term road closures. Okay, on page 5, IE 4.3, Councillor Ford is releasing, recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 23 in favor. Thank you, Councillor Fillion. On page 5, PH 5.7, Toronto Local Appeal Body Chair's Annual Report. Thank you. Page 6. Councillor Holliday. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like a recorded vote on SC 5.16, Traffic Control Signals Review, Morningside Avenue, Encumber Avenue slash Ford Overdrive. Okay. Recorded vote on SC 5.16. Recorded vote. The item is adopted 21 to 2. Page 7. Page 7. Page 8. Are you on page 8, Councillor Fillion? Councillor Fillion, page 8. CC 7.1, Ombudsman Annual Report. Page 9. Okay. If I could have uh, a member of council hold down on page 8, CC 7.2, uh, the appointment of the lobbyist. Okay. Councillor Fletcher? Okay. Page 9. Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like a recorded vote on CC 7.11, 1200 Dundas Street West Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application. Request for direction. Page 9, CC 7.11, recorded vote.
Councillor Ainslie, please. Councillor Ainslie. Councillor Ainsley, your vote, please. The item is adopted twenty one to two. Councillor Carroll. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. On page 9, CC 7.12, Carillion Canada versus City of Toronto. Okay. Councillor Thompson. That was the one I wanted to hold. I just took my name off, Speaker. Okay. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, my apologies. I just need to go back to page 8. Um, just for, I think, a short while, um, can I please hold CC 7.5, Appointment of Public Members to the Toronto Community Housing Corporation? Okay. Thank you. All right. I will now consider requests to make items urgent and time-specific. Councillor Fillion. Yes, I'd like to request that the um, Ombudsman's oh, okay, annual... Okay, no, just a sec. Apparently, Councillor Bylaw, the name came up, Councillor Bylaw. Go ahead. Can I? Yes. Okay, great. I would like to make item uh, CC 7.3, uh, the first item uh, tomorrow, uh, first thing in the morning. Okay, CC 7.3, first thing tomorrow morning. It is a proposed Bill 108. Okay, all in favor, carried, Councillor Fillion. Uh, CC 7.1, Ombudsman Annual Report, first item following members' motions. You're the new Sarah Yep, she is. All in favor, carried. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Fillion, please. <clears throat> the order paper is adopted unanimously, 24 in favour. Thank you. Members of Council want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions. In particular, if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I will insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you. I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Members, City Council follows a routine for the processing and adding of any motions without notice during the meeting. Please remember that a motion without notice must include a reason for urgency. If you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, please give your motion to the City Clerk staff. <clears throat> they will prepare the ne necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. The chair must agree the motion is urgent before you can speak leave to introduce it at this meeting. It will require 18 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during the meeting. Motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. I will be reviewing all motions carefully and will advise council after each recess which motions need a motion to add to the agenda. We'll now go to the mayor's key item, MM 7.13 with HL 6.1.
questions? Oh, yes. Um, notice that this motion has been given a two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. Recorded vote. Councillor Cressy, please. Motion to waive notice carries unanimously 24 in favor. All in favor of waiving, uh, waiving referral, recorded vote. Councillor The motion to waive referral carries unanimously 24 in favor. Questions? Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'll direct my questions to the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, Dr. Davila, uh, when were you notified of retroactive cuts to the City of Toronto, to Toronto Public Health by the province? So through the Speaker, we were notified uh, via teleconference uh, at a meeting that was uh, organized by the province on April the 18th. The Thursday afternoon before the Easter long weekend? That's correct. Was there any warning or consultation prior to that? No, there was none. Thank you. Uh, what is the financial cut to Toronto Public Health this year, which is retroactive? So through the Speaker, the cut for this year is $65 million. And next year, 2021? It would, in 2020, it would be $21 million over and above that 65. So $86 million. That's correct. And in the year after? An additional 16.2, taking us into the range of about $102 million. And the year after that? Uh, a total of uh, 107.6. Okay. And over 10 years, how much does that cut amount to? Well, it approaches about a billion dollars over 10 years uh, as you add the cumulative impact. Okay. Were you notified a few days ago of an, a new and an additional $20 million cut to Toronto Public Health effective next year? Through the Speaker, yes, we were notified of an additional $20 million cut to the funding envelope. This is new. This is on top of the $86 million. That is correct. And what, on what basis were we just notified by the provincial government of a new and an additional $20 million cut for next year? Through the speaker, it's my understanding that these are meant to be achieved through administrative efficiencies. And when were we notified of this additional $20 million cut? This was in subsequent conversation with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care on May the 2nd. Okay. Is Ontario the only province that does not fund public health funding at 100% of the costs? Through the speaker, yes. What was the funding ratio the province provided prior to SARS and Walkerton to cities? Through the speaker, uh, at one point in the late 1990s, it was 100% municipal, and then thereafter, from the late 90s to the mid-2000s, 50-50. And after SARS and Walkerton, was that cost ratio adjusted? Through the speaker, yes, it was adjusted uh, between the period of about 200, 2005 to 2007, from 50-50 to 75-25, in recognition that uh, they wanted, the province wanted to elevate the level of public health in response to incidents like SARS and Walkerton. So is it accurate that we are returning to a pre-SARS and pre-Walkerton model of funding for the City of Toronto? Through the Speaker, yes. All right. What percentage of Toronto Public Health's budget goes towards frontline programs? 
Through the Speaker, with respect to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care funded programs, 91 per cent of the dollars provided there are provided directly to programs and services. And the outstanding 9 per cent goes towards what? So through the Speaker, the uh, other 9 per cent goes through things that might be considered more administrative back office support functions that actually allow those programs and services to be delivered. Thank you. Um, how many doses of vaccines do we provide every year in schools? Through the speaker, it's about 50,000 doses of vaccine that we provide to schools or students in schools. And how many dental screenings do we provide for uh, kids aged 4 to 12 each year? Through the speaker, it's about 220,000 such dental screenings that occur on a yearly basis. Student breakfast programs, how many kids receive a meal each day? Through the speaker, it's about 212,000 students covering 634 schools throughout our city that participate in our breakfast programs. Is the province meeting the council-endorsed uh, share of its funding for student nutrition? Through the speaker, in short answer, no. Thank you. If these cuts proceed, is there a risk to student nutrition programs in our city? Through the speaker, if the cuts as proposed proceed, I would put to council that every program offered by Toronto Public Health is at risk. Thank the cuts you. are significant enough that every program is at risk. Can we find $65 million in in-year savings this year without impacting programs? Through the speaker, no, we cannot. If these cuts proceed, are Torontonians' lives at risk? Through the speaker, given the nature of the programs and services that we provide, I do not believe it is hyperbole to suggest that there is risk to the lives of Torontonians if public health is underfunded. So that's a yes. Torontonians' lives will be at risk. Through the speaker, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, questions to the City Manager. Uh, Mr. City Manager, first of all, I want to thank you for the report that you did uh, outlining the $177 million of um, potential cuts or concerns on the 2019 budget. Now, there's been some comments um, that these aren't real numbers, that in fact they're, they're, they're a lot less. So can you comment on the validity of these numbers and how they impact the 2019 or can potentially impact the 2019 budget? Through the Speaker, um, this report was prepared through the uh, assistance of many of the professionals that are in the room here today, so accuracy obviously is critical. Uh, so we are providing information based on the best available information from the province. Uh, as noted earlier, our budget uh, uh, was completed back in March, and the, uh, the cost of these cuts uh, will have or place a significant pressure on our 2019 budget should you ask us to uh, uh, reconsider the, uh, the approved amounts. So from your perspective, these are real numbers, and we're going to have to deal with them in a very serious manner. Correct. Uh, you did mention that uh, you are been sitting down with the province, uh, having ongoing discussions and talks. Are you confident that you have been, through these talks, discussions, been provided with the, the right kind of information you need to, to make the assessment of what kind of decisions we need to make? Uh, through the speaker, uh, there are various tables. I mean, certainly the one that I attend is the one related to transit, and, and obviously the gas tax is a, is a point of discussion. Uh, the uh, advancement of other talks at other tables is at various stages, so um, we're providing you the best available information we have. I can't absolutely guarantee you that uh, the numbers that are in front of you are final numbers, uh, so we will continue to do everything we can to reach out to our provincial colleagues to uh, give you as uh, clear an indication of what the financial impacts are to the 2019 and beyond budgets. Uh, with regard to, to next steps, um, my assumption is um, if we have to find these 177 or some component within that, uh, we're going to have to reopen up the 2019 budget. Can you comment on what, what that means and the impacts to the process even after we've already completed the budget? Um, it's a very unique occurrence, as you can imagine, through the speaker. Uh, so staff are uh, right now starting to turn their mind to uh, the logistics that are involved in, in doing such a thing. Um, so we are, as well, we are looking at... Uh, the you know the magnitude of these cuts 
and uh, trying to assess how it is uh, from a 2019 budget, some portion of them might be able to be addressed. So, um, but uh, procedurally, there will have to be um, some steps taken uh, with the assistance of our solicitor and our clerk in order to uh, uh, make some changes to the 2019 tax budget. Uh, it's been suggested that um, we can find this money just through efficiencies. Uh, you've been here for a little over a year. That $177 million, can we find that in efficiencies? And, and how do we, if we're forced to find that money, how do we do it? What do we look at? I mean, other than we can raise taxes, we can do serious cuts to services, but, you know, how do we find that kind of money within the system at this point? Right. Um, well, we have a budget process for a reason, and that is where staff are given uh, the direction from council in terms of uh, the types of tax increases that you would uh, consider. Uh, it's our job to look at ways, and we've been doing this for a number of years now, as you well know, uh, to find efficiencies with our organization. But at this point, uh, where you're talking about uh, a figure that's approaching $180 million, um, it will not be achieved through efficiencies without affecting services. Um, even if a portion of it was to be dealt with through uh, uh, higher property taxes, it's still going to result in us uh, having to scale back on some of our service delivery. Um, the, the fact or the idea that we can do this without affecting any services is not possible, um, I don't believe, uh, at this stage, and, uh, and certainly is going to uh, create even more pressure for the 2020 budget uh, when we start to turn our mind to how it is that we're going to bring that forward. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My questions are for the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, my mother was a nurse, and I think she used to say to me that an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. Uh, is that your medical opinion? Through the Speaker, absolutely. I, in the world of public health, we concern ourselves with prevention. We concern ourselves uh, at working at a population level, but our focus is always on prevention where possible in order to prevent things from happening to, uh, and to enhance the sustainability of health care. Um, but in addition to keeping people from getting sick, it sounds like there's a good financial return on investments that you make. For example, I think I've read that uh, for every dollar spent on vaccination, you save approximately $16. Is this correct? Through the speaker, that's correct. Uh, again, there has been a long and documented evidence base in respect of the return of investment, return on investment, I should say, uh, when it comes to public health services. You're right, for each $1 that's invested in measles vaccine, you end up saving, for example, $16 in health costs. For each $1 that's spent on tobacco prevention, you end up saving about $20 in future health care costs. So, and these are just two of the examples, whether it comes to early childhood development, uh, addressing mental health uh, and addictions before they start. Uh, these are all uh, provide excellent return on investment and relieve the burden on our health care system. And I appreciate that we, we can't put a price on, on the health of a child, for example, um, but uh, we are seeing a rise in measles, and I think there was two cases that were seen yesterday. Um, is this correct? And is there a rise in vaccine he hesitancy that your office is seeing? So through the speaker, there is indeed uh, a, a rise and increase in respect of vaccine hesitancy uh, that is being noted, and that's not unique to Ontario, Toronto, or Canada. It's something that's actually seen throughout the world. It's one of the issues that does concern us because we do have a very effective prevention mechanism in the form of vaccine. So, and, and these diseases do cause significant, significant health issues and in fact have economic consequences as well. And what is the role that Toronto Public Health plays in immunizations in the city? So through the speaker, we actually have quite an extensive role in the world of immunization. We do provide immunizations uh, in school-based clinics. We have community clinics as well. And certainly part of our role is to ensure that students who are attending schools within Toronto are appropriately covered and are, actually do have the vaccines on board that they're supposed to have as per legislation in order to create a safe environment from vaccine preventable diseases within our school settings and within our broader community as well. 
We know that there are a certain number of people within our population who, for vari a variety of reasons, uh, medical reasons in particular, cannot be immunized themselves. So when we actually have a well-immunized population, we not only protect those who are immunized, but those who cannot, for medical reasons, get immunized against some of these vaccine-preventable diseases. So it is a protection for the entire community. I also spoke a little bit about the economic benefits. When children are sick, it means oftentimes that a parent needs to stay home from work. There are certainly costs associated with that that go above and beyond the health costs. Obviously, as public health, our primary concern is with respect to health, but we're obviously concerned as well with respect to economics and how that contributes to health. Uh, thank, thank you for, for keeping my children safe and for the family members of mine that are, have, are on uh, immunosuppressant drugs. And I just had one last question. On Friday, I had the ability to tour uh, the Scarborough Medical Clinics, and in particular the dental clinic and the sexual health clinic, and they spoke about the many, many patients that they see there and many of them waiting for emergency uh, care. Um, could you just let me know, would these programs be at risk if uh, there was cuts to public health? So through the speaker, if the proposed cuts as put forward by the province do go through, I would put to council that every single one of our programs is at risk. The, the cuts proposed are significant, uh, they're deep, and they have the potential to impact every single one of our programs at Toronto Public Health, whether they're Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care funded or otherwise. Thank you for the hard work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to the uh, Chief Medical Officer. Uh, Toronto Public Health uh, does restaurant safety inspections, is that correct? Through the Speaker, yes. And uh, in your best view or uh, opinion, what would happen to those inspections should these cuts go through? Well, through the Speaker, as I've tried to make clear to Council, all of our programs are at risk should the funding cuts go through. Uh, certainly, we would have to look at all of our programs that would include restaurant inspections to determine how best to manage under a uh, limited or restricted financial envelope. Now, clearly, the restaurant industry is an important part of our economy. Would would restaurants uh, fail to either start anew or continue to operate without an active inspection? So, through the speaker, uh, you know, I can't speak to what restaurants would do. Um, that would certainly be within the purview of those restaurant operators. However, what I can speak to is the fact that we do provide these important food safety inspection programs and that they do contribute to keeping our community safe from foodborne illness in particular. The um, one, of, one of Toronto Public Health's program is free dental service, I think, for seniors. Is that? That's correct. So approximately how many seniors take, take advantage of that program every year? So I actually don't have that number in front of me. I may turn it over to my dental colleague. Oh, yes. Uh, through the speaker, um, that we treat about 10,000 seniors per year. 10,000 seniors. <clears throat> and Canada Health Act, are there any provisions under the Canada Health Act and the transfer of monies from the federal government to the province that the province would be in violation based on, on these cutbacks to Toronto Public Health, or that hasn't been explored? So through the speaker, I would refer that to one of my legal uh, colleagues who would probably be better uh, able to speak to that. Uh, I do want to, however, uh, clear up, uh, Councillor Pasternak, that there is, uh, as part of the proposed provincial budget, the 2019 provincial budget, the province did announce a low-income seniors dental program that they would be funding. So while, yes, traditionally there has been a tr City of Toronto-funded low-income seniors dental program, uh, there was also, as part of the pr provincial budget announcement, a low-income seniors dental program proposed. And before we go to legal, um, student nutrition programs. Now, the province has said they're going to continue to fund it through, I think, Child and Family Services or, or, or that ministry. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we would not face cuts because choices, tough choices, have to be made. So the program is at risk. Through the speaker, yes, because there is a component, and it's actually the, the large component of the funding that's currently provided to that program, the largest component of the funding, actually does come from the city through the Toronto Public Health Budget. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, to um, 
I guess the city manager and, and his report here, he's, he's made a reference to the provincial gas tax, which clearly uh, its, it's, um, it's cutback is, is very severe. There's a federal gas tax that flows to the province and then is to be distributed to municipalities. How do the two mesh? I, I, we're, we're supposed to get federal money on the federal gas tax flowing through the province to the cities. Is that linked to this in any way? Uh, through the speaker, no. I mean, they're not, they're not, uh, they're cumulative. They're not, uh, and to our understanding, there's no uh, effect occurring with the, uh, with respect to the federal gas tax. So. It flows through the province and that isn't part of this discussion. Correct. Okay. Um, now we transfer, we transfer funds to, to the province. We have obligations uh, to the province. Uh, uh, Go, Go Transit is, is, is one that comes to mind. Um, I don't know whether any, there's been any discussion about holding those funds back to backstop some of our public health funds. Would you recommend that kind of action or is that a road we shouldn't take? Um, through the speaker, um, I always think it's a good idea to give you all options and, uh, and the risks associated with those options. So uh, at some point I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to give you uh, our best ideas as to how to deal with uh, uh, this challenge. I mean, we're obviously still holding out uh, the prospects that the, the province would reconsider its uh, its decision. So I know the, the council and the mayor have uh, are working hard to see if that would happen. So uh, I want to be a little careful about uh, yeah, showing no, my hand. De-escalation is the key. That, that was your last question. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, to the city manager, uh, in your May 9th briefing note, you stated that the province hasn't explained uh, why Toronto's cost-sharing formula is different than every other part of Ontario. Um, since May 9th, have we heard back from the province with an explanation of why other boards are expected to pay less than a third and, and Toronto's expected to pay more? Through the speaker, no. We're, we're still uncertain as to why we've been singled out. Um, we've also heard that buried in the public health cuts are additional cuts to services that were 100% funded originally by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term uh, Care. Uh, that are, those are initiatives like our Healthy Smiles Ontario program, Infectious Diseases Control Initiative, and the Smoke Free Ontario Strategy. Um, have you, uh, do those budget impacts, are they included in the $65 million estimate here in Toronto? Through the speaker, yes they are. Um, I've been talking to many of my residents about the impacts of these cuts uh, in Ward 19. Um, in our community, public health has nutrition programs in schools like uh, O'Connor Primary all the way down to Kew Beach, uh, walk to school programs from Crescent Town to Earl Hegg, and childcare inspections for almost 60 different centres. What's going to happen to these services until we come back with a plan to balance the budget? Through the speaker. Uh, we're still trying to understand the details of what the Ministry has put forward in respect of their uh, budget uh, proposals. Once we actually have a better sense uh, as to those uh, cuts, then we can start to work as a senior management team at Toronto Public Health to figure out how best to manage the restricted envelope while at the same time trying to protect the health of the residents we serve as best as possible. Uh, we've heard from yourself, we've heard from the city manager that there was very little discussion with the province in advance of these cuts. Um, how much could we have predicted or anticipated the, uh, these, these cuts during the budget process? Well, through the speaker, generally what happens, I can't speak for every aspect of the budget, but with respect to public health, we generally have conversation with our colleagues at the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care usually in the fall of the year proceeding to make determinations on the budget. We did not receive any signal to expect anything more than the standard. Uh, we were expecting that there may be some interest in, in making some efficiencies and, and, and some cuts in the name of efficiencies, but we certainly weren't expecting anything on the scale that we're seeing today. Thank you. And through the speaker, I mean, that same principle, I think, holds true to the remainder of the cuts that we've identified in the report. So there hasn't been the kind of dialogue that you would expect well in advance of us setting our budget and uh, and the province making its decisions. 
And of course, the municipality has a different budget process than other levels of government, and uh, we're not carrying debt, and we have to have a balanced budget. Um, how do we respond to these sort of cuts, given that our budget is passed uh, several months ago and we're partially through administering those programs and in our 2019 year? What, what are the options for us to respond to these cuts from the provincial government? Um, through the speaker, the, um, we're about five months into our 2019 year, so a uh, considerable amount of money has already been expended, which uh, leaves only you know, the remainder uh, uh, to uh, continue on with the programs that you had approved. Um, I expect that I'll be uh, directed to report back as to the options that are available to uh, try and deal with uh, whatever portion of this challenge that we have in front of us. Um, but you know, you can't rule out there being a second tax bill. Um, uh, that's one option that we can give some consideration to. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, if the expectation were to somehow address this Hundred and uh, uh, almost 180 million dollars through just efficiencies without any effect to services. Uh, I don't believe that's possible. Uh, I appreciate that sentiment, and I also recognize that we are in year one. We have three more budgets to pass in this term of council. Um, from the city manager's perspective, how will this affect the way we manage our budget process in the subsequent three years? Uh, given this is the first time through, and uh, Obviously, the province is, is moving forward with these cuts, and it hasn't been a very collaborative or consultative experience. How are we going to account for that or respond to that in subsequent budgets? Um, so um, each year we have a, when we begin the budget process, we have a, usually a, uh, a very large challenge uh, to address. I mean, keep in mind that we're a growing city. We grow by about 30 to 35,000 people every year. Uh, in the next 20 years, we're going to grow by a million people. Uh, this adds nothing but service pressure that we have to somehow address. So you have that fact. You have the dynamics of the community that have been changing over the last decade or so in terms of more people are slipping out of the middle class and finding themselves struggling. So that creates pressures on our services. And then you heap on top of this, not just the 2019, but the future challenges that we face that have been outlined by the province that... Uh, are in, are in the range of, you know, in excess of a billion dollars. So you factor that over the next three years, uh, it's going to make this notion of uh, maintaining um, inflationary budget increases very, very difficult given that this organization has for a number of years uh, met the challenge of trying to keep taxes reasonable. Uh, so unless we're prepared to consider service cuts, which uh, much of what we do is legislated, um, you know, it's really, it's effectively, fi we're finding ourselves between a rock and a rock. Thank you. Okay, before we go to the next questioner, um, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Speaker, this morning we, I was about to introduce the students, principal, um, and also leaders who are part of the uh, Walk for Value from Sate Size School. This school is actually the uh, number one rated school in the province of Ontario for their EQA and have been for the last five, ten years actually. Uh, the future doctors, scientists and lawyers and hopefully politicians are actually in the audience here and I want them all just to say hi to everybody. But Speaker, I want to welcome the students uh, here from Satisai. They're here with uh, their principal, Dr. Revati. Uh, Chanabati, and also the chair of the Walk for Values, uh, Suka uh, Balsu Rami. And uh, the Walk for Values uh, raises the awareness of five human values. The first one being love, peace, truth, right conduct, and nonviolence, and the importance of practice, practicing them daily. Uh, they will be walking on Sunday, May um, 26, from 10 a.m., and they'll be uh, basically coming to Nathan Phillips Square. They'll be raising the, uh, the flag on May 23rd at uh, 12 noon, so if you're able to join them. And again, I would just simply like to welcome the students and uh, community leaders and uh, the principal from Sate Sai School in Ward 21. Welcome, students. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Ford, questions? 
Uh, thank you uh, very much, Madam Speaker. I, I would like to start off my questions um, either to our finance staff or, or to our city manager, um, whoever's appropriate. But why, um, so how much money in total do we get from the province of Ontario? Total for the entire operating budget uh, for the Toronto Public Service. Through the speaker, I don't have that at my fingertips, uh, but certainly we can get that figure to you uh, very quickly. With, and, and that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll wait for that number. But having said that, I, it would be a very significant amount of money, percentage-wise, let's say. Uh, through the speaker, there's no question. We rely on those transfers. Is um, the date of the budget, when it is approved by City Council, is that set in law by any chance, by any provincial act, when we approve the budget? Uh, there is a, through the speaker, in terms of when we approve our budget. When we approve it, yes. Yes, I mean, certainly there are, when we pass a certain date, there is a, uh, there's certainly a financial penalty that we incur if we don't get our budgets approved in a timely manner. So, um, but uh, in this particular case, obviously after an election, we were a little later than normal. Uh, right. Hence the reason why we approved in March. Of course. Um, but my question is, is that, is there anything stipulating um, with financial prudence, that's where I'm coming from in my questions here, that we have to approve a budget before the province of Ontario approves their budget? Uh, through the speaker, I mean, that's normally the case and that we do approve ours before the province approves theirs. And, uh, and as I think indicated earlier, typically we have some sense of where the province is going with their, their programs in terms of whether or not we should be factoring any of those concerns into our budget. I guess taking a more of a financially responsible path, maybe it, we can look at adjusting how we approve our budgets um, before we know how much money any government or the province of Ontario is sending us. Maybe that's a possibility. Uh, through the speaker, you repeat that question, sorry. So, well, my, my, my question is, um, I guess I've already asked it, but um, it's around adjusting our budget cycle to know what funding we are getting from the province of Ontario before we kind of guess the funding and forecast it for a budget cycle. Sure, I mean, we, we are dealing with different fiscal years. There's, yeah. there's not much different, uh, not much uh, debate about that. Um, but as I say, I think in the past, uh, we haven't had too many of these circumstances arise like the one that we're dealing with right now. So, and we've relied on uh, some uh, assurances from our counterparts uh, when we do set our budget. So it certainly has worked in the past, but uh, you know, if the argument was made that we should be on the same fiscal cycles, uh, it could help uh, address these kinds of future problems. Um, do we know um, how much uh, money it will cost the city if we go ahead um, with one of the recommendations uh, to start, uh, to, uh, where is it, um, to start an ad campaign? using all ad resources possible. How much is that going to cost the city? Uh, I don't have an exact number uh, unless uh, some member of the staff, no, I don't see any heads nodding. So, There's but no I mean, idea how much, if we approve that, we're going to be spending. That won't be allocated, because I assume we're going to take a financial hit by ad advertisements, wouldn't we? I mean, we... So we have... Uh, I mean, we have accounts that, uh, that uh, uh, set the amounts of, that we do allocate for advertisings and works of this nature. Um, I don't see this as being an uh, uh, overly expensive um, endeavor, to be quite honest. I think we're, we're talking thousands of dollars, certainly not uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or, or anything more extraordinary. So, um, but to have uh, an exact figure right now, I don't have one for you. Okay, um, and my, my last question, because my time's uh, coming to an end here, that went very quick. Um, but m my last question is to the mayor. Um, if Mr. Mayor, there's a question. Oh. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, in, in your opening comments, and, and it, it was kind of conflicting even just on the floor of council, you said that you made multiple invitations, the city of Toronto made multiple invitations to the province of Ontario to have conversations and they have not 
um, welcome that invitation. I've heard uh, multiple times on this council floor from city staff already that there is conversations happening with the province of Ontario and specifically your office. Just, well, I can only say, Madam Speaker, through you to the member, that uh, uh, there have been no uh, responses to the invitation that I've made to have a specific uh, process uh, where any group of representatives of the City of Toronto sit with representatives of the province to discuss as a whole this uh, long list of cutbacks that have been made. Uh, there have been discussions, but as my, my understanding of them, Madam Speaker, is that the discussions, say, between the Medical Officer of Health and her counterpart uh, provincially, which have been subject to some confidentiality, have not sort of focused in on saying, well, let's sit down together and review these cuts and see if we can find a different way to do this that doesn't affect our programs. I can certainly tell you with respect to things like the gas tax, it's come up indirectly at the table, as I think the city manager made reference a few minutes ago. But I will say to you, in all honesty, there, have been, there has been no response to an invitation that I have made uh, publicly many times, including this morning again, to say let's have a process that specifically uh, focuses itself on sitting down and looking at this long list of cuts and deciding if there's a better way to do this, where we actually get to talk about these areas together. There's been no response to that, politically or from the public service. Uh, and I will tell you that um, I made that proposition uh, directly to the Premier when we happened to see each other uh, not too long ago, and there was no response from, from that. And not that I expect, because I mentioned something to him, that uh, he's going to respond, but I'm just saying there has been no response from anybody, political or uh, public service, to the notion of sitting down and having a methodical review. And I furthermore, I think as you know uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I have said that, uh, taking a bit of a leap of faith here, that, that we would bring our books to the table and say, fine, if you want to sit down and go line by line through public health, we're willing to do that and defend these programs uh, as being well administered and much, much needed by the people of Toronto. So I can only say that that is my information is there's no response to that invitation, even though it's been made many times publicly, and I understand several times publicly by me and by others. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you. My questions are for child care. Children's Services, sorry. If I could have the uh, clock reset, um, Madam Speaker. As, uh, okay, j just one sec, hold on. Thank you very much. Are all the, the staff here? Yes, they are. Okay, go ahead. If I could, to the Interim General Manager of Children's Services, it's been repeated several times by provincial officials that the cut to children's services is largely ad administrative. Uh, what is the breakdown of the cut to children's services? Through the speaker, there's three categories in which uh, this children's services budget has been impacted. One is programs and services. The other one is the change to cost sharing. And the last is the change to administration. Now the third piece is the, the province has, uh, fourth, fourth piece is that the province hasn't renewed the fee stabilization fund, correct? That's right, that, pro that program will not exist in 2019. So let's start with the first, the programs and services. What kind of programs are these? In programs and services, the bulk of that is fee subsidies. Those are supports to families in the City of Toronto who can't afford the full cost of childcare, as well as supporting children who are in childcare programs with extra support needs that need some support to maintain their, their placement, as well as a capacity building within the system and quality. Okay, so for these children with, and families with special needs, can you give us an example of the type of family that might depend on that, the type of program? Well, this would be families with uh, children with a variety of special needs, whether it be children on the autism spectrum, uh, physical disabilities, and certainly medically f fragile children whose families need to go to work and whose children have special needs and need to be supported. So we have staff that go out and go to every single child care program with a child with special needs and support the staff in building their techniques to support that child so that child doesn't have to remain at home. Thank you. And the, the, the cut, the, the $80 million cut, 
is 33% from these programs and services category. Yes, that's correct. So these are special needs programs and, and what you've just described. The cost share program, what is that? The cost share program, we have a number of programs that the provincial government asked us to administer at 100%. They, the province funded 100% of these programs. Now they're asking us to cost share those 100% at 80-20. So in fact, the, 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 this, and this represents 50% of the total $80 million reduction. That's correct. The administration, that's 17%. Only 17% of the total that's correct. Total reduction, yet it's been repeated that it's largely administrative. That's right. So uh, can I get, uh, j just to be clear, the fee subsidy program that the province, uh, that, that the province is implementing and we're the service delivery agency, there's a requirement for administrative that's outlined in regulation. It's outlined in the policies and guidelines. When there's a fee subsidy program administered, there's a requirement to administer it in the provincial context. So we don't have a choice when dealing with the province about administration? No, the way it's administered and the type of program, meaning income testing, we have no discretion on how we administer that. It is an income test prescribed by the province. Okay, thank you. Um, on the final category, this is the fee stabilization reserve. Um, how much of an increase for full fee paying parents would the removal of this fee stabilization reserve equate to? Centers that receive the fee stabilization, they were able to reduce their fees to families in the City of Toronto by 4.3%. 4.3% for full fee paying parents they will see as an increase because this provincial program not represented in the 80 million has also been been eliminated. That's correct. Now, what will the cuts to the child care fee subsidy mean for existing subsidized spaces? We are projecting a loss of 6,166 fee subsidies in the system. So that's uh, that's 6,000 odd children and families that have less access to childcare. That's correct. What will it mean for some centers that have a large number of subsidized spaces in them? It will certainly impact their financial viability. They will see uh, an increased number of vacancies that they will not be able to fill because we have a reduction in fee subsidies. And finally, if I could, what, what is the wait list for subsidies? on our, uh, what is the existing wait list for subsidies? We're currently a little over 13,000 fam, or 13,000 children waiting for a fee subsidy. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, questions? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I have a health question and then some childcare questions. In the, the, the public health budget, you, you highlight three of the 100% funded uh, uh, programs, Healthy Smiles, Infectious Disease Control, and, and Smoke Free. There are some other smaller price tag ones. In the main, if a, if a program is 100% funded, can we assume it's because it was something that the province was mandating itself to do, they asked us to deliver this program on their behalf? So through the speaker in general, I think that's a fair summation. So, so uh, in, in saying that we're no longer going to fund it all the way, they're, they're in, in fact saying we, we no longer are mandating that this be done. Through the speaker, that's not the understanding that I have from the province. What we have been told so far to date is that the funding arrangement for the program has changed and that any changes in respect of the mandate have yet to be discussed. We have not heard any specific uh, information or advice that our programs have changed. In fact, to the contrary, we have been told that we should continue to maintain the current level of service and there is an expectation that that would be the case. But they're making a really fundamental policy change, aren't they? Um, uh, something as, as uh, uh, important in preventative health as infectious disease control. I would, I would assume they're funding it 100% because they see it as as a health care thing, a, something that's, uh, you know, health care, we, we see it in Canada as something that's wealth redistributive, 
and so we take it from income tax. You're making a big change here in saying property tax should now fund a, a, a really important component of health care. So through the speaker, my understanding is that those particular uh, envelopes of funding were provided in the post-SARS, post-Walkerton era right. in recognition of the challenges that those kinds of infectious diseases present to communities and in recognition of the fact that infectious diseases tend not to respect municipal borders. So at that point, they saw it as their role, but they realized we were better positioned to deliver it on their behalf. Through the speaker, that would be my understanding, that, and in fact, public health has always been delivered at the local level. Okay, and uh, uh, if I can move to childcare, a similar thing could be said in childcare in, in, in achieving certain goals uh, within the childcare system province-wide, um, in, in mitigating some policy changes that, that might affect childcare, they 100% funded it. We didn't say, hey, we're having trouble affording this. Can you start funding it 100%? They asked us to deliver on, on something that they knew was important to the system. And, and we said, yes, we will do that for you. Is that, is that the scenario? Through the speaker, yes, that is the scenario. So again, we're making a fundamental change here. If they're saying, we still want you to do that, but we're asking you to now pay for it with property taxes, they're making a pretty significant policy change. Uh, yes, and may I add also in some cases they've, they've lowered the allocation for the program. Yes, and if we can't come up to meet that 50, they may give us a little transition time, but ultimately they're going to say this is a matching fund program. If we don't get all the way there, they're going to come down even further. Is that, is that something we've seen in the past? Yes, and that, makes, that exacerbates the whole program, the, the whole problem for us. Now, there's a small price tag one in, in the report. Um, I'm not sure who can answer this because I think it gets uh, dispersed by tests. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the transition child benefit. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if somebody could explain that. Uh, 22 million is what we uh, put out. I think I might need a pause, Madam Speaker, to find somebody who can answer trivia questions about the transition child benefit. Hello, Mr. Novogrodsky. <laughs> Transition child benefit. Um, I'm wondering if we can get at the, the damage of, of, of not talking to us before doing this. In this one, um, we, we, we uh, send out on their behalf $22 million to people who need that transition child benefit. But we're only serving the clients who need it within the OW realm. Is it, it's provincial caseworkers who deal with ODSP? Through the speaker, uh, that is correct. So the City of Toronto issues transition child benefit simply to individuals in Toronto who are in receipt of Ontario Works financial benefits. Right. So is this the danger of not coming to us first and talking to us at the right time? Is it possible that far more people end up in this circumstance of needing the transition benefit as a result of suddenly ending up on OW? Uh, than a parent who is ODSP and might well have been ODSP before even having a child? Are we, are we dispersing the lion's share for them and no one thought to ask Dr. us Carol, what the impact would be? That's your last question. I'd love the answer to it. Thank you. Through the speaker, the majority of transition child benefit recipients in Toronto would be in receipt of Ontario Works, but there would be a number of other individuals in Toronto in receipt of ODSP who would receive their transition child benefit from the province. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I'm just wondering if we have any idea how many families or how many children will be affected by the elimination of the funding for child care subsidies. The total loss in, in subsidies for the City of Toronto yes. is 6,166. 6,166 fee families? Fee subsidies, so that fee would be subsidies. individual so children. Th those are the children. Any idea how many families that might be, if there's more than one or two? No, children? it would depend on who, um, who applies, but I can tell you that uh, lone parents on our, in our subsidy program range around, I think it's 78% of okay. the families 
our lone parents. So if we take, so really it would be um, upwards of 5,000 families and uh, so many lone parents yes. that would be affected. And this is, how is that going to affect child care centers in general? Now there's some child care centers that may have more subsidies than others and some have more full fee paying parents than subsidies. So this will disproportionately affect those centers that have more subsidized children. Would that be correct? That is correct. Those, those centers that rely heavily are, are, are located in areas where families need assistance. They will be greatly impacted. So this really has to do with moms, mostly, what you're saying, single family that uh, are lone parents who have their children in childcare so they can work and they get a subsidy so they're not paying all of their salaries out, that they will be inversely uh, hit with this and then that will affect the childcare centres in the poorer areas of Toronto which the subsidies have gone to assist those, those basically single family lone parents in those areas? Yes, we are worried that it would destabilize some of those programs. And do you have a list or where those might be? Have you put that together yet? Yes, we do. Okay. Can I just ask quickly about the yeah. student nutrition? Who's somebody there for student nutrition? Can you hold my time, speaker, because we're finding the person who's going to ask, answer. Are you holding? Yeah. This is student nutrition. And currently, uh, the City of Toronto, I forget, it's maybe 10, 11 million dollars that we're putting through into student nutrition, and the province puts in about nine. So through the speaker, the City of Toronto is actually putting something a little closer to uh, 14 and a half million dollars. Yep. And what's the provincial? A little under nine million. You're yeah, correct. so it's around nine million. How, what will the cut mean for their nine million dollars? So through the speaker, we've heard nothing with respect to any changes around the provincial share of the student nutrition program. We haven't. That particular program is funded through the province by the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. So nothing, I'll just ask the city manager or someone, we've heard nothing about any cuts to student nutrition through the ministry that delivers those dollars to our foundations. Nothing. Through the speaker, no, not, nothing. So that specific. seems to, at least to be stable, okay? Um, that's good. And then I'm just going to go back to the child care for a second then. So will this in any way mean that others will have to pick up the slack for the subsidies that are being lost, that fees will have to be raised even more for full fee paying parents in order to cover off the operational costs lost because of the elimination of the subsidy? I cautiously say yes. Um, however, in those areas where those centers rely heavily on fee subsidies, those are areas of the city where families can't afford to pay. And we don't have a lot of families in those areas that would access those centers that could pay. So you could increase those fees, but the full fee families may not be in that neighborhood. Yes. Well, this might mean some closures. Uh, how we're scrambling. We're going to be scrambling. This is a very serious issue because mm -hmm. they're in low-income areas, subsidies. There's nobody to pick up the slack. I think everything is on the table, and that would be a consideration. And how are we communicating the whole issue to all of the child cares that for which we are the service manager in the city of Toronto? Has there been a special letter go from Children's Services to the parents indicating what's happening? That's or are we... Has that happened? Last question. At this point in time, we have what's called child care forums where all child care agency service providers can attend and we're doing an information session. From there, well, at this point in time, these are high level assumptions and we do not have the guidelines. We don't have a contract from the province, nor do we have the guidelines that stipulate the conditions in which these programs can then be um, administered. This 6,000 could be higher or it could be lower. So we're just going to wait until we get the guidelines. Thank you.
Councillor Wong Tam. Yes, thank you very much. Um, with the 6,166 potential subsidies at risk and the 13,000 uh, families on the wait list for, um, for the additional subsidies, uh, my math is correct, if you can, if you can help me out, that we're, we have approximately over 19,000 uh, families that will be directly uh, impacted by this decision mm -hmm. from the province. Is that correct? Through the speaker, yes, that's correct. And, um, and so those 19,000 families, um, will there be other alternatives? Like, do, do they call upon their families? Is it about uh, d deciding not to go to work, uh, asking for elderly parents to come and take care of the children? How will people make the... Uh, the, the arrangements to, to provide care for, for their children? I think those decisions are the same decisions that are made every day with the money or without the money. People make decisions on their care arrangements based on their own needs and their comforts and their values and principles. So, And would you say that, that um, uh, reductions to child care services and, the, and subsidies, that it, would ha that it would impact men and women equally? or will there be a disproportionate impact to, to the primary caregiver of those children? And who would they be? Yeah, uh, m most of the families, the lone parents who receive a fee subsidy today are females. Uh, they are women. women. Yes. And, um, and so those women would have fewer opportunities for childcare, uh, fewer opportunities for employment, uh, fewer opportunities to go back to school, fewer opportunities in life and civil society advancements overall, if the childcare uh, cuts go through. The cuts will disproportionately impact women. Great, thank you very much. And uh, my next question is to Medical Officer of Health. With respect to the primary users of, of healthcare, public health care services, I know that there's a number of programs that, uh, that are offered um, that are specifically targeting um, uh, women who are expecting children and, of course, uh, uh, the children themselves. Um, who are the primary users and, uh, and benefits, uh, uh, benefactors of public health? So through the speaker, for many of our programs, given that one of our fundamental objectives is to reduce disparities in health status that exist in our population, many of our programs are directed towards those who are more vulnerable, those who are more marginalized, those who are socioeconomically uh, challenged in our city. And oftentimes, who would fit into those categories? Uh, through the speaker, uh, there are a wide variety of groups. We talked, I've just described some uh, who are socioeconomically challenged some who are members of more racialized communities and marginalized on any number of reasons uh, that exist. Out and that there. would also include women? Yes, indeed it would. And with respect to changes, um, if I can just ask some questions about uh, the social assistance programs. Um, and changes to social assistance, just because it's contained in the report. Um, primarily, who are the, the low-income, vulnerable individuals in Ontario who are uh, uh, who are relying on ODSB, who rely on so special, special assistance, who would be generally impacted? So through the speaker, the individuals who would be primarily impacted by the proposed elimination of the transition child benefit would be either refugee claimants who've been in Canada for 18 months or less, or individuals who in a prior tax year would have had an income which uh, rendered them ineligible for the Ontario Child Benefit. And if we were to, to place a gender and to, to make some, um, uh, sort of take a look at who is receiving those benefits, uh, who would get those cuts? Where would those cuts land? Uh, we would look, need to look at the data uh, more carefully, but um, m my sense would be that uh, women would be disproportionately impacted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, with respect to uh, cuts to Legal Aid Ontario, and I recognize that this is not necessarily directed at the City of Toronto, but there will be uh, some absorption of services that we will have to provide because residents can't get them through, through legal aid clinics. Um, and right now in the report it says that we will see about $164 million cut from Legal Aid Ontario. We know that there's a lot of legal aid clinics in the City of Toronto. Who are the primary users of those legal aid services? Um, can you give us an economic profile, uh, a profile around their, their gender, their status? Who, who might that be? Through you, Madam Speaker, while I don't have any statistics about that, I do know that anyone who wishes to use the services of a legal aid clinic 
must uh, provide some information about their income because those clinics are uh, established for the purpose of, of serving the needs of low-income residents. And because the um because most of the, uh, the low-income wage earners, uh, many of the people who are living below the poverty line are racialized, are, 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 are obviously poor. Um, and it's, it's, would it be safe to say that, there, again, there's a disproportionate impact on women, and especially perhaps single um, uh, mother-led households? That was your last question. For you, Madam Speaker. Again, while I don't have statistics, I believe that to be true. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you. I'd like to begin with the Medical Officer of Health. Could you uh, take us behind the curtain a little bit about uh, the machinery that we have to have in place to handle a, a, an outbreak of an infectious disease? So through the speaker, uh, we can. Uh, I can tell you at a very high level with respect to infectious diseases, it's everything from detection to treatment and case and contact follow-up. But for details, I'm going to refer to my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Finkelstein. He's in charge of our communicable disease control area. Thank you. So through the, the speaker, I think um, the medical officer um, did give a, a high-level overview. Um, we have epidemiologists who are there to summarize the case information and identify changes in patterns of disease, investigators who call people who might have been exposed to an infectious disease to follow up to make sure that they're well. Um, we have uh, information technology specialists who gather up the data from these investigations and managers to coordinate all, all of this work when we do get a, a, a case. And that's not something that you can bring in retroactively when a hospital says there's a problem. You have to have all that machinery in place ahead of time. So through the speaker, you're absolutely correct. And again, there's the glue that holds this all together. There has to be relationship existing between the various players, whether we're talking about those that are in the public health shop or those that are in the health care system, plus the communications infrastructure to inform the public of the risk that exists and how best they can manage it. And the duty to have this infrastructure in place and to make sure it's working, that falls on your shoulders as a legislative mandate from the province of Ontario. Is that correct? Through the speaker, that's correct. There are roles as well that the province has to play, as there is a chief medical officer of health there as well plus a uh, provincial public health agency, and they have specific roles to play as well. And, but, but to be very precise, you, you have legislated duties that, that you must achieve around preventing these outbreaks of infectious diseases. So through the speaker, that is correct. Thank you. To the city manager, um, one of the things that's been troubling me particularly about the 180 million or close to 180 million is that we're being asked uh, to deal with it mid-year. We can't simply cut 180 million dollars of an annual service mid-year, can we? Uh, you, through the speaker, you, you can't without consequences, significant consequences. I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is uh, we're halfway through the year. We've already spent half the budget on various programs. So if we want to save a dollar on a program, we're going to have to cut two dollars. Through the speaker, that's generally correct. And further, further to that, uh, as if we're eliminating a service, we're going to have contracts with suppliers, we're going to have employment contracts and collective agreements, which means that the cost of getting out of those services is going to be still larger. So through the speaker, I mean, typically we have clauses in our contracts that allow us to make those kinds of decisions, but they're never free. They're never free. So it would be fair to say that to, if we tried to take $180 million out of our budget, it would cost us, uh, you know, I'm using ballpark numbers, at least $360 million if we try to do it halfway through the year with all these other costs associated. So through the speaker, I think, uh, you know, if directed to report back as to how we might approach this, uh, I would fully expect that it's not going to be a dollar for dollar uh, type of report. We will be identifying the larger costs that are incurred just to achieve the 180 million that's being discussed. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, I, I guess this is to uh, the deputy city manager. So with uh, uh, Councillor Ford was earlier asking questions about how uh, you know, a whole lot of money comes from the, from the province for our budget. Uh, taking ODSP and OW as an example, that money comes and then it just flows right back out. We don't act, you know, it's not something we have any discretion over. 
So the, the, the actual OW benefits are paid 100% by the province and the admin cost 50-50. Right, but they flow directly from us to the eligible client. But it shows up in our budget as a transfer from the provincial government and we have zero discretion. We can't do anything about that. It just flows right through. That's correct. Similarly, uh, uh, with childcare, we have uh, a bunch of money that the, the province tells us how we have to spend it. It arrives here and then it flows out. That's correct. And that's the same with public health. The money arrives here. Councilor there are Kirk, provincial laws. It arrives and that it flows out according to those rules. That was your last question. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd, I'd like to ask the City Manager a couple of questions. Uh, in terms of the figure of cuts, where the, the total seems to be in about the $180 million range. Does that include... Uh, the cost to the city in the reduction of development charges that developers will have to pay as a result of Bill 108. In other words, we're going to have to go w without tens of millions of dollars that developers used to have to pay for sewers, for sidewalks, for roads. Now they're going to be off the hook for all those charges. Is that part of the $180 million cut? Through the speaker, no. Do we have an idea how many Hundreds of millions, those uh, freebies for developers are going to cost the taxpayers of the City of Toronto and our budget. So through the speaker, and I think this item was referred to for tomorrow, um, there's a report coming that's going to try and itemize what that uh, financial consequence is. So, but that is not part of the 180. So it could be 100, it could be 180 million plus uh, tens of millions more. So we're just not looking at. Uh, 170, 80 million. We're looking at who knows how many more. Uh, that's the big question we might be able to answer tomorrow. The question is in terms of uh, the issue about uh, the province gives us uh, all this money, uh, do we uh, have uh, the ability, and I know you're going to be asked to do this in the motion, do we have the ability to know how many dollars Torontonians pay to the province every day? in HST, provincial uh, income tax, uh, small business pays in tax. Uh, can we itemize those dollars that flow from the pockets of Torontonians every day into the provincial coffers? So through the speaker, uh, we could certainly look into that. But just to give you an idea, Toronto Census metropolitan area, uh, which is goes beyond the Toronto boundary from a GDD, GDP perspective is almost equivalent to Alberta, almost equivalent to Quebec in terms of the taxes it generates. So we are a tax giver as opposed to a benefit taker when you look at the two numbers. So we've been contributing to the country, to the province significantly for a very, very long time. So the money that we get from our benevolent provincial government basically is our money. That, that is the money of Torontonians who work hard, pay taxes, HST, they pay uh, you know, tax for liquor, for gas. All that money goes to the province and comes back to us in their benevolence uh, to help pay for services. A very, very small amount comes back. So we can hopefully get that. The other thing, uh, you know, this emphasis has been on the Board of Health and other uh, critical uh, services we provide. Given the size and scale of these cuts and the timing of these cuts, it's not just going to be the Board of Health services and uh, those the people who work in those areas are going to feel these cuts. That it's going to have to be police, fire, uh, everybody's going to have to share the pain. It's not just, well, some people say to me, well, Board of Health, you know, we can deal with that, and they're just uh, Board of Health. And I say, oh yeah, okay, Board of Health. Yeah, but you know, this kind of money, we're going to have to look at all the budgets, uh, parks and recreation, we're going to have to look at public works, we're going to have to look at police, fire, that you're also maybe going to be feeling the cut as much as the uh, people who work and provide the services in child care Board of Health. Am I not right? Through the speaker, I think you're correct. The last thing, as you know, one of my favorite things is transparency in your tax bill. When you get that tax bill, I hope whatever impact ends up befalling us, that we have a line on that tax bill that says, 
the provincial government's cut tax levy that you have to pay. So in other words, if we end up having to cut uh, or add more taxes to people, other can we put a line in the budget which outlines the amount of money in the property taxes people have to pay because of the cuts made to Toronto by the provincial government? Can we put that line in the, in the tax bill? Uh, through the speaker, uh, in short, yes, we can. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my uh, questions, I believe, are to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Um, Dr. Davila, your report um, from May 13th um, has a number of figures in it. Uh, I guess the most important one that stands out to me is a $65 million cut to the 2019 budget, or, or a loss of revenue, I guess, is the better way to put that. I'm just trying to understand attachment number one. Can you explain to me, are these all of the services that we are mandated to deliver according to the laws and regulations and requirements of the province? So through the speaker, uh, what's required of local public health is articulated in legislation and is articulated in the Ontario public health standards. What you have here is a list of the programs that are currently funded uh, through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, but it's not the total sum of all the programs offered by Toronto Public Health as required by the standards. So how does the $65 million cut relate to this list? So the way that we looked at uh, trying to characterize and explain to Council the funding cuts, we looked at the total funding envelope such as it exists uh, currently, and we basically uh, el um, implemented the changes. So there's a component of the budget that has traditionally been 75-25, 75, 25, 75 provincial, 25% municipally funded, and a component of the budget which has traditionally been 100% provincial. That 75-25 component, we were advised by the provincial government that it was going to a 60-40 split effective April 1st, and we were also advised that that 60-40 split would also apply to the 100% provincially funded, and through the calculations based on the total funding envelope, uh, that's how we came up with the $65 million in reductions. So I did some quick addition. Uh, I hope I got it right, but the total programs on this report from yesterday is $180 million. That's the total package, and the current provincial funding is $140 million. So how did you... Is, is the 65 derived out of the $140 million, or is there something else that's not on this report? I'm, I'm just trying to understand all the pieces in this and what it means. So there are pieces. This is about the actual programs and services that are uh, delivered towards the public. Uh, as I mentioned earlier through the speaker to in, a, in order to address an earlier question, there are some support services that are also funded. Those are not included here. Uh, support services that effectively make those programs and services deliverable. So However, the $65 million is in respect of the reductions overall given the funding changes uh, proposed by the provincial government. So I've got on my computer screen here, I've got a, a budget submission from Toronto Public Health and I suppose what I'm struggling to do is match what we've got in the report and what we've heard today at Council with the total package of the budget submission it says here the provincial subsidies are 183.5 million. At least that was what was recommended in the budget. Going back to the 65 million, how does the 65 million relate to the 183, and how does that 183 relate to what's in your report? So through the speaker, there are provincial subsidies that are provided through Tor Toronto Public Health, some of which come from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, some of which come from the Ministry of Children and Community and Social Services. So when our total budget submission is put together, <coughs> provincial subsidies include uh, not just the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care uh, funding dollars, but those from MCCSS as well. So the 65, if I may, through the speaker, relates solely to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care funding envelope. So what comes from Children and Youth Services? You said the Student Nutrition Program, that was $9 million. Is there anything else? 
So we do have a number of other programs that are funded through the uh, Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. Just to give you a little bit of a flavour, preschool speech and language program, our infant hearing program, our healthy babies, healthy children program, and these are just a few. There are a few more and I'm happy to provide you with a complete list. What would it take to get a column, an extra column on this report that would show the net impact of the funding changes or could I just do that calculated by hand and then what would it take to get some additional lines so that I could see the complete picture of how 65 million squares up to your budget submission squares up to this and then overlays of what are the mandatory services that we're required to deliver in law versus ones that maybe other service levels that council may have more discretion over. That was your last question. So through the speaker, I'm sure we'd be very happy to work with you to uh, provide the details that you're looking for. I would just remind you that, uh, remind the councillor that in fact, remember there are parts of the budget that are Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care funded. There are elements that are Ministry of Children and Community and Social Services funded. They are separated, but we're happy to put them together and the numbers do line up. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know who um, would ask to actually ask the question of, but um, I guess my first question, and I apologize if these have been asked uh, already, um, has this ever been done this way before? Like, i.e., we're like four or five months into the year, and, uh, and you know, uh, the provincial government says to us, by the way, you know that uh, those programs you were running, well, we're not, or, or you know, you, you thought you were going to get X number of dollars from us? Uh, but now you're going to get less retroactively. I mean, it's, it's all retroactive, yeah. correct? Essentially. That's correct. So, so it all like starts January 1st. Uh, April 1st. Sorry? April 1st. April 1st, okay. Um, has it ever been done this way before? Not in my recollection, and I've been in public service for over 30 years. So, so no government has actually come after the fact and says, oh, by the way, now you've got to you got to go back and revisit all this stuff after you've done your budget, right? That's correct. Okay. So this is a, like a first of its kind. Based on my memory, yes. Um, because essentially our property tax bills uh, have gone out. We've set our tax rate. Uh, we've set all of the other uh, revenue rates that we normally uh, set throughout the year. And uh, um, so now we have to go back and revisit that, I'm assuming, correct? Well, council adopted the budget, including the municipal tax levy, in early March. So if we initiate the process all over again, so go back, uh, re-establish our budget committee, go through that exercise, it could be several months before uh, we actually develop a plan on how to deal with this. That's correct. So in that time, we continue to pay for things as they are, even though we're essentially not getting any money for it, right? So that's correct. We are at, at the moment, we are assessing um, possible areas of that we might look to to reduce in order to try and meet the, the shortfall in revenues that we're anticipating. Uh, how much does the, does the provincial government um, transfer to the City of Toronto uh, for everything on a yearly basis, um, as we understood it a couple of months ago? So on the operating side, uh, it's roughly 2.4 billion. 2.4 billion. Um, in I believe there's monies also related to capital, but I, do, I don't have those on my on the top okay. of mind. But the 2.4 billion. So when we uh, established our operating budget, um, um, you know, um, last month or uh, I think it was last month, right? Uh, we March. basically included in that budget. Uh, $2.4 billion in, in total expectations of monies that we would essentially begin receiving from, from the provincial government. That's correct, based on um, historical and traditional cost-sharing arrangements. Okay. Uh, so, they've, so, so this is kind of a, sort of a, a bit of an unprecedented move. Now, why, don't, why haven't governments ever done this in the past? Anybody want to speculate on that? Like, why, why no government, like a serious government, why a serious government wouldn't come in after the fact and say, hey, by the way, uh, boys and girls, we gotta, 
we got to change the rules of the game here. We got to like we got to set the clock back and and because Councilor because you didn't. Uh, please yeah. ask your question. Then how you know ask your question. My question is, yeah. why has no government well, ever done this in the past? Who can, nobody can answer that. Who can answer that? Do you want me to answer it? No. <laughs> Councillor Peruzza, let's move on, please. Uh, so, 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 uh, my last question, just really a sort of a speculative one. Uh, why, um, why did these folks do it this way this time, for the first time? If, if I can, through the speaker, that, that's. I mean, they must have given you it, it some some uh, uh, reason for it. Um, I, and, and I heard my, my good friend, Councillor Holliday, talk about how it, the deficit or whatever their financial problems are, but that can't be the reason, right? The, I mean, to be, you know, again, I think we've said it, and I, this came without uh, a lot of warning, and uh, this is an unprecedented step that has been taken. As, as to why it's been taken, I'm not going to speculate as to what the total rationale was, but. Uh, the bottom line is, is that at this point in time to not just find the savings but to address the challenges is going to have you know substantial effect on a number of people who rely on these subsidies uh, you know to look after their children to look after our, their health and so we are you know uh, if, if directed obviously we will come back and not just speak to the financial consequences of this and how to manage it uh, to the extent you can but also speak to the uh, you know, the detrimental effects that this will create in the lives of many of the people that live in this community. Okay, that was your last question. Councillor Kerjianis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I was, um, it could be out of order if I am, please uh, let me know. But I, I, you just say that every time you get up. <laughs> I want to thank Councillor uh, Gord Perks. Uh, however, you know, I'm appreciate the fact that he might be out of order 150 uh, percent of the time. Madam Speaker, my questions are for the uh, Acting Deputy Chief of Paramedics. I want to know how... Okay, just give, it, give him an opportunity to step down. You want to start down. my time over? I'm not going to set it over. I'm going to put your time on hold. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Perks. Exiting the room. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Hold on, hold on. You ready? Okay, go ahead. Um, we've um, read through the press and through reports that you're going to be in a shortfall of 3.8 million, close to 4 million. Would I be correct in that, sir? Uh, through the speaker, yes, you are correct. Can you tell us if this is going to be impacting you in, in the first year, second year, third year, or fourth year of operations? How, how, how far are they looking to carry this over? Uh, through the speaker, um, our business right now is under extreme pressure from call demand. Uh, we've, over the last 10 years, we've experienced emergency call demand uh, increases of 4%. Last year was 5.4%. Uh, this reduction in funding will exacerbate those pressures. But how long will this reduction of, uh, of funding? I mean, what are they looking to carry this $3.8 million over how many years? Are you aware of it? I mean, uh, through the speaker, no, we have not been provided any further information on that. Um, what would that do if, let's say, if this was to be spread over two years, what will that do to your capacity to deliver service to the citizens of Toronto? Um, at, through the speaker, as, as I said, the pressures in, in call demand continue to increase. Uh, this will impact ambulance availability, and it will impact our ability to get to critical patients. Uh, patients will wait longer. Um, through the speaker, I just want to clarify, the $3.8 billion is coming out of our 2019 allocation. It's not spread over two, two years. That, that's why. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to thank you. So if this is the $3.8 million is going to come out, out of your 2019 allocation, how many less paramedics would you be able to, um, to uh, enhance the city by? Uh, through the speaker, uh, this year we were not adding any additional paramedics. So this pressure will uh, impact our ability to backfill. So um, it will reduce our ability to backfill in a way we'll, we'll experience more overtime pressures uh, to fill those. So there, since there's no new additional ambulances on the street from paramedics this year, uh, it, will, it will impact service delivery for sure. So if I can be, another question that I have for you is that if the, the length of time right now takes, let's say, four minutes, 
this 3.8 million less that will how long how would that impact your 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 time to uh, respond uh, through the speaker at this point in time we are projecting a uh, our response time uh, deterioration to critical patients. Last year it was 11 minutes 45 seconds, 90% of the time. Uh, currently we're projecting 12 minutes and 5 seconds, 90% so of the time. So we will have a 15% increase, would that be correct? Madam Speaker, I can't hear myself. Councillor Cressy? The councillor can hear himself. Would, uh, would I be correct in assuming that will be 15 to 18% increase in waiting time? Uh, if I do the math, uh, I think you're correct, yes, sir. All right. Now, what pressure would that put on your service and what your, your ad would be, your ask would be of the city if we're not able to reverse the uh, $3.8 million? Um, uh, uh, through the speaker, I was directed through the budget process to come back with a multi-year staffing and system plan, and that plan is coming to Economic uh, Community and Development Committee this, uh, this month, and it outlines the pressures. So pressures include uh, increasing uh, WSIB pressures from, from stress-related incidents of the paramedics. Um, the growing and aging uh, population in the city is our, is our chief demand uh, pressure. Um, and I don't see any of those pieces uh, disappearing. So Is your service the only one being hit from, front, from uh, first responders? I mean, is, are you aware if uh, there was a hit of a reduction to a fire department or to the uh, police department? Uh, to the speaker, no, I'm not aware of any change there. So your service is the only one that's going to get hit by 3.8 million, and that's going to reduce, it's going to increase the responding time of 1. Uh, 15 to 18 percent. Uh, to the speaker, I would agree with that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, that's it for the questions. We'll go to the speakers. Mayor Tory. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion uh, which has been pre-circulated, and I want to just speak to some parts of it. Uh, I think it is a motion that has been uh, broadly discussed around the Council. I think it tries to be uh, businesslike in its approach uh, in both registering our you know, opposition to the cuts that have been uh, imposed here, uh, but at the same time suggesting some things we might do to better inform the public, but also making a very important offer in the second uh, paragraph uh, again. Uh, to uh, sit down and, and go about this in a more orderly, business-like, uh, sensible way. And I guess if I want to draw attention to anything in uh, paragraph number one, it is the word retroactive. And I think as, as we've gone through uh, the discussion this morning, the question period, uh, and it really does speak to some of the questions, for example, most recently Councillor Peruzza was asking, it just doesn't make any sense. And it's one of the reasons why when asked if this has ever been done before, the answer was no, because I think nobody who thought about it carefully would have ever brought about a retroactive cut partway, a good chunk of the way through the budget year, because I think we all know that when you have to then respond to that a good chunk of the way through the budget year, you have to do twice as much in the way of cutting to maintain uh, the balanced budget and to see things through and see the services uh, through for the rest of the year. So it, the part that I think is, is, is most... Uh, you know, most galling about this is, is how people, and I say some of the very senior ministers in that government were very respected business people, respected including by me, um, and people who I think understand very clearly that when you impose a cut halfway through a budget year, it, it isn't fair, it isn't sensible, and it imposes a, a, an obligation on the body receiving the cut to do a lot more than what the face value of the cuts would appear uh, to impose. Uh, and, you know, I heard the city manager making reference uh, to the, the, a couple of minutes ago, he said it was without much warning. Well, he makes himself the 2019 champion so far of understatement um, in that regard. He could, be, he could be usurped from that role before long, you never know around here. But without warning, I mean, it was done retroactively, and I think that's important, but without warning is an understatement. I mean, we, we got literally, uh, even, it wasn't even disclosed in the budget address. So we had to wait to get these kind of unannounced emails, some of them coming on the eve of holiday weekends and things like that, and that's not fair or businesslike either. And that is why I draw your attention to paragraph two of this motion, which restates our willingness to sit down with the government and maybe start over on the basis that we will acknowledge, as I have done repeatedly, others here have as well, that they have some financial issues to deal with, acknowledge that you can always find more efficiencies in the way you do things, always, but that you have to do it together. You have to do it together. You have to sit down and go through line by line and program by program and responsibility by responsibility and find a way to do that that is not going to impose the kind of burden that these cuts done this way at this time 
uh, will have uh, on the residents of the City of Toronto. Uh, the next thing I want to draw your attention to is just the subsections, some of them of, of, of paragraph 4. I think it is very important for us to look at not just the social and human impacts that the childcare cutbacks will have on people in the City of Toronto and families, but it will have an economic impact as well. There are people without our assistance who cannot go to work, who want to work, which I think is important in and of itself, but who I think it is to our benefit to have them working, not to mention to the benefit of their own families. And when you have literally people in the City of Toronto who will say, because of a government policy imposed by this government, that they can't afford to work, that's a very sad statement. You know, we should want people to want to work if they want to work and be able to find a job, which is our task in creating a healthy economy, but also to give them the support they might need in order to work. Uh, I go down to, from there, which is the, related, the, the potential economic loss to the City of Toronto from, uh, from uh, the, uh, an epidemic. I mean, we saw, and, and again, the human side of this was more important than the economic side. We, we lost 44 lives in SARS and many others were ill. But we also saw that the, the place was devastated, our city. We, we, how soon we forget from an epidemic that the, the, no tourists came, no business people would come, there were warnings issued, you shouldn't come here, and it took us years to recover from that. And then I go on from there to the tourism. You know, while it isn't the most important human cost, I think it's the one that makes the least sense of all the cuts, frankly, because all the return, all the financial return from all the tourists who come go entirely to the other governments and not to us. We have the benefit of these people coming to our cities. We're happy that our restaurants and hotels are doing well. But all the financial benefit goes to the other governments, including the provincial government. They would get way more back from tourists who come here than the $9 million they've cut. So you have to ask yourself, why in heaven's name would they cut it? Did, any, did they ask anybody? Was there any discussion about the business case for this? And then the final point I'll make, because I've had a chance to speak earlier on, is, is the inflow and outflow of tax dollars. I tried to get the numbers from my office. Maybe it's on my phone now before I spoke. But uh, the bottom line is that, here it is here, that, that we have uh, billions more going out to the other governments. And I don't even object to that as a matter of principle. Toronto is a fortunate city, we're doing well, and people should pay their share, and we want to support other parts of the country, other parts of the province, thanks to our success. But the notion that we should be deemed uh, sort of a, a, an appropriate target to have more than other cities in the province taken out of what is being uh, cut here is nonsensical in view of the fact we send billions more to these other governments. And, and frankly, we do it most of the time without complaining. But we wouldn't expect them to be treated more harshly than other cities and towns uh, than uh, are treated in, the, in, this, in these cutbacks. That is also a very objectionable part of all this. So I hope people will support this motion. I hope we will have a good display of solidarity and have not too much engineering of it. I, I respect the right of other members to get up and do some engineering, Madam Speaker, but I think uh, there's a message here and a suggestion of, of, of directions and latitudes we give to the city manager to help us put our message across more effectively. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Kerjanis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to the Mayor, uh, it was interesting to hear that uh, you were saying that we are a target in the City of Toronto and, and a lot, lot goes to other cities, but this is not something new. This has been going on for years. So my question to the Mayor is the following. Is this move, that the way that it's come so fast from the provincial government, in any respect reflecting the, uh, the difficulties between us and them? I mean, would you have seen it if it was another government, would you have seen it coming a little bit later, more consultation, more uh, able to sit around the table and, and be able to, to speak to each other? I guess, uh, Madam Speaker, through you to the member, uh, I referred earlier on this morning to the fact that in a previous time, when I wasn't even here in 2013 and 14, the government of the day, a different government, uh, imposed substantial and fairly unilateral cutbacks uh, on the City Council of the day, and I was interested to find the quote of the then uh, Vice Chair of the Budget Committee saying that was not fair to sort of have those downloadings onto the City Government. And so it's happened before, and I remember as well uh, being a party to meetings between then Mayor Lastman and then Premier Harris about similar uh, downloading that took place, and I was actually sort of a, an intermediary that went to a couple of those meetings to try and secure some help for the City of Toronto uh, with the Mayor because I was, was, was able to talk to both of those people. So I don't think it's the first time it's happened. What's different, I think, this time is two things. Number one, the retroactivity. 
Uh, I think, as I, as I recall, in 2013, when the reductions were made, the first of those reductions actually took place the next year in 2014, so they gave the city at least some time to prepare. And so that doesn't make it right, but it makes it better. And the retroactivity this time, to me, as I said, is unacceptable. And secondly, uh, I think that, uh, now I forgot what the second point was, but, but I, I'll, I'll remember it in a second. But so, so um, uh, I think that, uh, oh, the second part was the, the fact that this took place without any uh, consultation at all, and, and I, you know, that to me is, uh, and, and, it, and it also tr treated Toronto, at least in one area, more harshly than any other city. That is the one question of all of this that nobody has yet answered. There is some vague mumbling about economies of scale, but that's a, a ridiculous assertion. We have bigger scale problems here in some of the areas that have been cut and bigger responsibilities, and the notion we can achieve a lot by way of, of economies of scale I don't think makes sense. So I think the harsher treatment of Toronto on the cost sharing is inexcusable, has no rationale behind it, and maybe that one you can suggest had certain motives behind it. I haven't done that because I just say it's inexplicable and we should just uh, treat Toronto the same as other people. And, preferably reverse the cuts. So let me uh, dwell into uh, the motive. Could the motive be that uh, uh, the Premier is trying to get back at the city? Could it be that the Premier is trying to get back at you, sir? You have not heard me, Madam Speaker, through you to the member engage in that speculation at all. Uh, first of all, I, I, I guess given the way I try to conduct myself in politics, I find it inconceivable that anybody could, you know, kind of uh, make public policy important, crucial public policy decisions on that kind of a basis. Um, and uh, I, I think from my conversations even with this Premier that I don't sense that that's what, what he's doing or his government is doing. I do believe that do. some of these cuts uh, you know, came from, as I have said, finance department officials just taking their red pencil and deciding who's going to notice if we cut 65 million out of public health. Um, there are some comments that get made in the, in the, uh, in the cut and thrust of legislative debate that uh, you know, suggest that there are um, other uh, motives at play, but I've not engaged in that speculation. I wasn't here uh, at the time when, uh, when, when uh, there were other members of this council that, uh, uh, that, that are now on to provincial politics, uh, so I just don't get involved in that. I just really want to see us sit down work together to discuss better ways to achieve efficiencies together and stop this kind of unilateral uh, uh, treatment that also treats Toronto more harshly. So when you were engaged back in when Mel Lastman was the mayor, things were happened were done different with Michael Harris. Well, not but the, the fact that there was downloading that went on uh, is a, a question of fact, Madam Speaker. Uh, that it happened then, it's happening again now, and it happened in between with Mr. McGinty and Mr. Uh, I guess it was was Mayor Ford at the time. So it happens repeatedly. I mean, it is rapid, a it is a definitely counterproductive development in. Uh, in, in our system of government that, that the province feels it can sort of from time to time when it requires to do so, download onto us unilaterally. In this case, it was done both unilaterally and retroactively and more harshly on Toronto. So it makes three uh, things that are sort of this unacceptable about it. In this my case. last question, Madam Speaker, yes. is this is the first time, Mr. Mayor, that you're feeling this. It's the first time that a provincial government is acting toward this way towards the city. Yes, Madam Speaker, uh, I, I have said before that I find it uh, unfortunate in our system uh, that uh, municipalities, especially this one with its size and sophistication and duly elected, very healthy municipal democracy, are not accorded more respect in terms of an ability to make decisions on our own about photo radar being returned or traffic wardens or, you know, you can go down a long list. I find that nonsensical in 2019 based on a document written in 1867. It's ridiculous, but I also understand we're not likely to see the Constitution amended anytime soon. I do find this chapter, which involves unilateral, no consultation, retroactive uh, cuts and cuts that are imposed more harshly on Toronto than anywhere else, beyond anything that you could imagine in terms of just really going about doing something that is going to extract maximum harm uh, from us, and more importantly from us, I don't mean us in the sense of council, I mean our people that we represent, who, I'll conclude on this note, are the very same people they represent, and the very same as, as they often point out, the same taxpayers, the same one taxpayer. That's why I think it's so important we get the message across to the MPPs, who also represent the same people we do, that this is not the right way to go about this. Let's sit down if we're going to talk efficiencies and have that conversation, but don't do it unilaterally, don't do it retroactively, and don't treat Toronto more harshly than you treat other cities and towns uh, in the province of Ontario. Thank you. 
There, we do have another question for you, Councilor Wong Tan. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and through you too, Mr. Mayor. Um, with respect to the uh, the individuals that will most likely be impacted by these uh, uh, very drastic uh, budget cuts, um, through my questions to staff, uh, many of the staff persons have said that it will most likely impact. Uh, uh, racialized individuals, low-income individuals, uh, women disproportionately, um, and I think that uh, in the uh, in the city manager's report today, uh, there was not an equity impact lens that was placed over the, uh, uh, the the report. And I know that you're asking for a report to come to the executive committee or a special meeting that you will call. Um, would it be a friendly amendment if we were just to make sure that uh, that uh, that any report on service cuts and and tax changes would also have a, a gender and equity impact lens? on it? Madam Speaker, through you to the member, I would have no uh, objection would see that as a friendly amendment because I've said myself in commenting on these changes since day one that if you look at who's going to get the dental checkups uh, you know, of necessity, there are others who, many who probably receive them who go to a dentist already, but there are many more uh, where it's even more crucially important they should get a dental checkup through public health because they don't go to a dentist. Uh, and you could go down the list. The same with the child care subsidies, obviously. I mean, these are people who are uh, you know, less in a position to look after their own child care expenses and get some help from us. And as is the case with our uh, neighborhood improvement areas and so on, they consist, as we know, uh, disproportionately of people who are from uh, different racialized groups and that impact obviously is falling disproportionately on women. So I would find that to be uh, a friendly amendment and I think as the staff are doing the work it would be easy for them to, uh, relatively easy, nothing's totally easy, but it would be easy for them to comment and, and offer us some degree of analysis on that aspect uh, of, of the most vulnerable being hurt the most by these kinds of cutbacks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cressy to speak. Well, thank you, Speaker. And let me begin by thanking our staff, <laughs> our city manager, the head of children's services, the whole team at Toronto Public Health. You can imagine the angst that spreads within the civil service, uh, not only because people are wondering about their day-to-day -day lives and their jobs, but because of the programs that they work tirelessly for. And so I want to thank them, and I want to thank the mayor. Uh, I am fully supportive of the motion in front of us uh, and grateful and, and deeply impressed with his unwavering leadership at this critical time. Uh, and I would reference a line that Councillor Matlow has used, which is that this is Team Toronto. Uh, and uh, sign me up. Right now I'm on that team. We are the largest city in this country and we are the economic engine of this province. And we have been given retroactive short-sighted and dangerous cuts amounting to $178 million, which put not only the health, but the prosperity of our city at risk. So I'd ask you to consider three areas, the process, the programs, and the growing opposition. Consider the process. Without warning and without notice, a retroactive cut after we have done our own budget, and a cut that disproportionately <coughs> impacts the City of Toronto. On public health, the funding share is going to 50-50. For every other region, it's either 60-40 or 70-30. On what basis do you do that? None have been provided. Now, it's, it's not a stretch to say that Mayor Tory and I, we don't vote the same way on every issue. But I don't think anybody would dispute that our Mayor is at all times deeply reasonable and measured. When the mayor of our city refers to these cuts as a targeted attack on your city, you know you've got it wrong. You truly do. Because I know how, how serious it is for our mayor to say something like that. Because it's true. And so consider the programs. Consider the programs that are being retroactively cut. Child care for low-income households. Vaccination programs for kids who need vaccines student breakfast programs for kids who need a healthy meal, TTC repairs to keep our streetcars and our buses and our subways running on time. For goodness sakes, they've even cut the paramedics budget. So not only are you cutting the programs that we run to keep Torontonians healthy, but you're cutting the services to respond to people when they get sick. It is vicious in its design. And so consider, for the third, the opposition. Consider Toronto Public Health as one example. Fifteen boards of health 
from Halliburton to Waterloo, from Thunder Bay to Sarnia, have opposed this. The 28 mayors of the largest cities in Ontario have opposed this. They represent 67% of the population. The mayor of Tweed, Ontario, opposes this. So goes Tweed, so goes, insert the rest. The Toronto District School Board, the Toronto Catholic District School Board, the Association of Catholic Trustees, the Ontario Medical Association, the Nurses Association, the Pediatric Society, I could go on and on and on, all of whom oppose the cuts. Now consider for a moment those who have spoken out in support of the cuts. Everybody. Premier Ford, Minister Elliott, and a dwindling number of provincial government MPPs. That's it. Not a single other association. And so I'll, I'll close by saying that yesterday, the Premier of this province referred to public health as nothing more than, and I quote, a bastion of lefties. On the same day that Toronto Public Health was busy stopping a potential outbreak of measles, that work was referred to as a bastion of lefties. And so, to my colleagues and to the provincial government, measles is not a partisan issue. There is no left or right or centrist way to stop the outbreak of measles. There's only one way, and that's with preventative public health work. And so, in the past, when this government has got it wrong, as they have done, whether on autism or the Greenbelt Foundation or cutting, not planting 50 million trees, they have reversed course. And so it is now time for us to come together as Team Toronto to make sure they reverse course here again. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor McKelvey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As a new member of the Board of Health, I wanted to gain a better understanding of some of the programs that are at risk by this cut by the provincial government. So last Friday, I went on a tour of the dental care and sexual health clinics at the Scarborough Civic Centre. And while I appreciate that these are just two of the many programs that are provided by public health, I wanted to do a bit of a deep dive into what I learned about that on Friday. Firstly, I was so impressed by how the doctors and the dentists at the clinics do so much with so very little. The dentist who gave the tour of the clinic spoke of the 8,000 elementary students identified each year in schools by their dental screening program. Public health follows up with the parents and ensures that each child receives the dental care they need for their different dental issues. And these aren't just small cavities. In many cases, they are more intensive and extensive emergency care. Many newcomers with no coverage are also treated at the dental clinic. During the sexual health clinic tour, they discussed the important services they provide, including testing, testing for sexually transmitted infections and low-cost contraception. Many young Canadians and newcomers aren't comfortable talking to their parents or their family doctors about these issues. Furthermore, they pointed out to me that the Ontario Medical Association estimates that more than 50% of LGBTQ patients are not out to their families. So there's many youth that aren't comfortable talking with their family doctors. The clinic provides a safe place for youth to seek treatment and prevention advice. Implementing cuts to Toronto Public Health is irresponsible and puts our youth and our most vulnerable at risk. The prevention and the early detection activities of public health yield an enormous return on investment. You heard the Chief Medical Officer speak earlier that 91% of the public health budget is spent on program delivery. Toronto Council needs to send a strong message today that cuts to any of these programs are not acceptable. I'm very happy today to support Mayor Tory's motion that he's put forward, and I'm very hopeful that we'll be successful with the reverse to the $177.85 million of unilateral retroactive cuts that have been put upon the City of Toronto in the 2019 budget, including and especially those to Toronto Public Health. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much, Madam Sp Speaker. I want to start by thanking staff for all of the work that they've been doing on this file and many other files. It seems like week to week, month to month down here in this chamber, we are constantly 
responding uh, to direction and cuts and announcements from the province, and I know that takes a, a tireless and tremendous amount of work on the staff side, so I am grateful for that. And I also want to thank my colleagues here in the chamber uh, for the continual uh, representation and town halls and petitions and transit stop meetings that many of you have been engaging on on this important issue. Now this morning we heard that during his time as a city councillor, the premier, the now premier, actually outlined the devastating impacts of these provincial cuts and described the city of Toronto as a prudent financial manager. Now I would have to say I agree that both are to be true. A $177 million cut with no warning truly is unprecedented. And this is, this is almost the entire amount that we actually allocate to our poverty reduction and well-being here in the City of Toronto, or nearly half the amount of the $308 million we have allocated for enhanced services in this year's budget. Now, as you know, we are all, uh, we are legislated, required to deliver a balanced budget as a municipality. We did this back in March, and that un means, unlike the province, we have very limited options for carrying debt. So at this point, at this juncture, to blow a $177 million hole in our budget retroactively means one of two things. One, we are going back to Torontonians and asking them to raise taxes for these sort of cuts coming from the province. Or two, to gut the vital services that many Torontonians and residents are, are relying on. So I'll be supporting the Mayor's motion and thankful uh, for his guidance in steering us through this difficult time. And I think as a council here, we are united in pushing back against the province and standing up for residents. We can show that taking money away from Toronto and cutting services will hurt our economy and hurt our prosperity, not just as a city, but in fact as a province. And all cuts are not created equally. And Toronto's, as we've heard, as we've learned, are being done above and beyond other municipalities. We will always be in a precarious position as a city because $2.6 billion of our tax-supported operating dollars comes from other levels of government. And that's why this motion is taking the right approach with a willingness to meet and discuss these retroactive cuts, but also pushing back and fully outlining the impacts for our budget. It's also why we need to find efficiencies wherever possible. It's not going to be $177 million retroactively in the five months into our budget, but we do need to find ways to keep our own budget healthy and strong and, and with strong capital reserves and clear priorities. That's why I want to do this work with Councillor Crawford and my colleagues on Budget Committee, and that's the place and the forum to do it. As our city manager said today, we have a budget process for a reason. This is obviously outside of that. And today it's really important that we send a strong message to the province. We have to push back on this and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I too want to thank the, the staff and the city manager for bringing this report to us in the manner that he has done in, in a very short period of time. Every year, I, uh, when the budget process begins, I sit down with the mayor and we have a discussion. Uh, we have a discussion, of course, on the priorities of city council, uh, but we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy on figuring out ways that we can save money in the city. We figure out ways that we can provide the right kind of services to the residents of the city, and we spend an inordinate amount of time looking at how we can get value for money. We have those same discussions with the uh, city manager, the deputy city managers, financial planning, all the divisions, all the agencies. This process has already begun for the 2020 um, uh, season, budget season. But we have this problem of $179 million that has been sort of plunked right into the middle of that. That's a serious problem we have to figure out, and I don't know where the answer is based on what I've heard so far. But when we're looking at what we've achieved, we've achieved significant savings in City Council over the last five years. We have been prudent managers. We have been successful, as the Mayor has stated, at keeping taxes low, but at the same time providing the right kind of services that the residents of this city require. Now, while I agree that it's critical for those efforts to continue, we need to sit down and to go over that plan moving forward that's underway. We should not be spending time rehashing what else we can be doing. 
We're halfway through our year, and to stop, to drop retroactively and make changes, that's not good governance. Over the past five years, there's been a clear commitment uh, to action resulting in efficiencies uh, with the cities and agencies. We have spent a lot of work in modernizing our efforts, and a lot more has to get done. I'm not suggesting we're, we're, we're there. Uh, we have netted over $80 million in the last five years um, in, in savings, reductions of 460 positions in, in those, um, those savings without any impacts to the services. So we are doing the work we need to do as a city. Uh, to help achieve those efficiencies, there were significant increases to the city managers, the chief financial officer, and the auditor general's budgets to ensure that they can find the kind of savings that we need. And of course, the Budget Committee supported the Auditor General receiving the increases to the, to the operating uh, budget to make value for money. Those investments have brought tangible results, and we see that in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, today, uh, and tomorrow we'll be talking about that, those tangible results that the Auditor General is bringing. They are doing their work. When you're looking at, and, and work needs to get done, changes absolutely need to happen. Uh, and we do that continuously, but to do it in the fashion that we've seen, dropping it on us, having to make that decision in the manner we're doing retroactively, from my perspective, is not good. I know in the Auditor General, she reported back in 2018 on children's services that more changes can uh, happen and there could be another economical service delivery model that we could look at increasing subsidies. I believe that is something we should be looking at that. But it can't be done retroactively. It can't be just dumped on us at the last minute. Are there opportunities to have a discussion with the Board of Health uh, through the budget process? There are, and I've had those discussions with the Board of Health. Uh, but again, and I think there's opportunities to look at changes, potential changes, but to do it retroactively is not good. Every budget and every budget process is hard. It's challenging, and it's supposed to be hard, and it's supposed to be challenging. But it needs to be done wisely, and it needs to be done with a plan and not in the manner that is happening right now, and not in the manner that it could potentially happen, which is, in the next couple of weeks, reopening up the budget process and having that process continue. That is not the right way to do things. The retroactive changes imposed by the provincial government, I think, are wrong. And, as the mayor said, I hope the province takes us seriously and sits down with us to look at a plan moving forward, because I think there is the willingness at Council to look at a plan moving forward. We have been doing that over the last five years. We'll be continuing to do that. But we need to do that with the province at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Matlow. I want to begin by, um, by acknowledging the Mayor and uh, Councillor Cressy, uh, along with many other members of council, but um, I've witnessed uh, truly remarkable leadership um, uh, at a critical juncture in our city's history. But you know, I, I come to council with a both a sense of necessity to work as a team, to work together. As uh, Joe uh, said, you know, I, I call it Team Toronto. Uh, <laughs> I don't, think, I don't think it's any secret that the mayor and I have had some disagreements. Many of us have had different uh, moments in our journeys that have been difficult. But there is nothing between us that outweighs how important it is to work together at a moment where our city is under siege, where literally every day there's another announcement by the provincial government that hurts the people who we care for, who we serve and support. I, I talked to a mom recently, as many of you have in your own communities, who finally believed that she was going to have a childcare space. And now it just disappeared. Just disappeared out of thin air, out of one announcement at Queen's Park. And her life is in turmoil. Like, it's a genuine crisis in her life, and she reflects many other people in the same situation. Um, we really are concerned about how we're going to be providing basic uh, health services. Uh, as, as Mike said earlier, Councillor Cole, uh, we are only learning now what the impacts are of Bill 108 on our ability to provide basic infrastructure and services to support the quality of life in every neighborhood in our city. And the list keeps going on. Paramedics, you name it. Every single day there's another, there's another cut. There's another announcement without any meaningful consultation. What this looks like to me is essentially uh, that we are under supervision by stealth. I mean, this is how they are behaving. 
It began uh, with the changes to the election in the midst of an election last year. Uh, they, they told us how our election was going to be against our wishes and against our resolution. Uh, they then unilaterally announced that they're going to be taking over our subway and, uh, and essentially selling off the lands and the air rights and a fire sale to, to, to fund other, other uh, uh, projects in other municipalities. And they say that we have a negotiating table, but I don't believe that's a negotiating table. I believe, based on their behavior, that that's their effort to get information out of us to help facilitate their end goal. It's a Trojan horse. And now they're making announcements every day that are hurting every aspect of our, uh, of our uh, government. I believe this is an argument for a charter. Uh, you know, the mayor, I think, rightfully said earlier that there isn't a quick or easy path towards a constitutional change. But it is bizarre that a, that a major city like Toronto, Canada's largest, is uh, governed under 19th century rules in the 21st century. That, as the mayor said, we, we can't even deal with basic traffic uh, regulations without going and begging them to uh, give us allowance to do some basic things on our streets. Never mind what many American cities have, which is they have purview over revenue. They have purview over land use planning. And yes, they have purview over their own elections. I believe we need to set the motion forward to be able to do that, because I know this government isn't going to agree to it, but if we can campaign together for a better government, then maybe uh, a better government will uh, be receptive to us. I know the federal government that we have today would be. They've told us that. Um, and we would not need to involve all the provinces. We wouldn't need the 10 province rule. We would simply need Ontario to be on board and a receptive federal government to actually become, not just in rhetoric, but genuinely a government onto ourselves and to have home rule. That's what I believe our future needs to hold. Right now, we're in this kind of weird position to call ourselves a government. Um, we have the highest level of expectations, the least amount of powers, and we're now in a position where we, all of a sudden, in the midst of a budget year, have to decide between, or perhaps both, uh, cutting basic services and raising taxes. What Doug Ford, even though he goes out there in this populist way and says, you know, tax and spend, tax and spend, tax and spend, this is even worse. His government is about tax and cut. His government is about making life more expensive for residents and decreasing the number of services that they're providing. That's unacceptable. Moving forward, I, I mean, I strongly agree with the mayor's strategy here to rally the public, go street to street, ward by ward. But we also, at the end goal, need to actually have the ability to make decisions about our own purview. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kergiannis? You're up to speak. You're getting interviewed? Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, certainly, this um, what is happening to our city of Toronto is something that is extraordinary. We heard the mayor say that this has happened before, but not with such a degree, if I can put it, of aggressiveness. This aggressiveness is something that um, we have seen other governments um, do and explore. But going retroactive is something that's uncalled for and uh, certainly impacts and hurts a lot of people. I want to talk about two issues. One is uh, service of EMS, and we heard from the chief and what he said. This is going to impact our ability to respond by taking the length of time that it takes to go to a, to a call 15 to 18 percent longer. That is totally unacceptable. That could be something which could be a threatening to a life and death situation. And I do hope that if that call comes and if that, that does not affect people's lives. The other one that I want to talk about, Madam Speaker, is something that we're going to be brief this afternoon. I, um, I've got something like 18, 20,000 doors, apartments that will be built in Scarbridge, of course, my area along Shepherd. And although I thank the Premier for announcing that he's going to come with a, uh, a subway line, on the other respect, is that he's going to go retroactively and slash and burn um, development charges. He's going to slash and burn Section 37. And that's going to impact me 
in my community by not being able to have schools, not being able to have uh, community spaces. So out of the 18, 20,000 new apartments that will be done in, Scar in Scarborough Agent Court, about one third of it would be two and three bedrooms, which one can extrapolate from that that we're gonna have any anything between 4,000 to 6,000 extra kids living in Scarborough Agent Court. Our schools are at capacity. We have built new schools, and right now there's portables at the back. There are schools that are uh, busting at the seams, and there are schools that are over 50, 60 years old, and they cannot handle the, uh, the extra capacity. There's one school, matter of fact, Agent Court uh, Public School, which is located on Midland, just north of Shepherd. That school is to be impacted by an additional eight to 10,000 doors. That's gonna be something like about anywhere between uh, 1,000 to 1,500 kids if you were to do the math. And the math could be wrong. But that school, being 100 years old, is that capacity right now. And kids have to cross Shepherd in order to get to it. And that will not allow us to be able to provide schooling, to provide parks, recreation facilities, um, other facilities that are might need it in order to look after our communities. And although I understand that some of the developers might not see eye to eye the way that we're going and they want to make things uh, to make more money, but that's not the way to do it. So I would say to the Premier that if you're getting pressure from the developers, you've got to realize that this is also affecting our constituents. But farther more than this, I think the, the, the elephant in the room, if I can put it as such, is the discontent and of the Premier against Mayor John Tory. Yes, in 2014, there was a, a bitter fight. And at the end of the day, one individual won. And the other individual now that holds a higher office might want to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it to get back at you. But he's not doing it only to get back at the city of Toronto. He's doing it to get across to the province of Toronto. But we are the target, period, full stop. When you got in one ward the ability to lose anywhere between 150 to $200 million in Section 37, and when you got in my ward, the inability to provide schooling for the kids and the inability to provide parks and other facilities for our kids, I think that's callous. And I believe that this divisiveness and this uh, um, back and forth has to stop. So my advice, be it to the mayor and to the premier, is that look, your aggressiveness and your division and all that stuff stops back in 2014. Moving forward, I think there's got to be other players in the room just besides the mayor, although I understand that he, uh, that he represents us uh, in the interprovincial uh, uh, and uh, federal affairs, but I think there's other people in the room that have to be there that have run or have been there before, like my, my colleague, Mike Cole, that was uh, a, the, the former MPP. We need to enhance and we need to reach out to those individuals and their talents when a conversation happens. And when the conversation does not include us, and it only includes one individual, thank I you. have to yeah, tell you it just you. leads to failure. Thank you, Minister. Okay, recess to 2 o'clock.